Dr. Pibamu, will you say a few words to start with? Yes. Good. Should we start? Or should we? Yeah, time, I think we should. Time, time. yes. Three, it's three p.m. We can start. Let's go. We should start. Yeah, go ahead. So it's with great pleasure I welcome all of you. Um, this uh, is a very interesting series of uh, uh, panels that we have been having. And uh, I really appreciate you all, uh, uh, all the panelists, uh, those who uh, give the inaugural, the chairing, and also the presentations. All of you, I really appreciate you very much. And uh, luckily, all of you have said you'll participate today. So um, we're looking very much that since all of you will be here, that you will be giving us the best uh, uh, ideas that will make us continue to apply innovation system in the African context. We need to reform and transform and develop Africa by promoting uh, innovation and knowledge to, uh, to really uh, bring Africa's agency. Africa's agency can be developed with innovation. And I think we should think of how we could do it. Uh, this Africa is a failure has to be challenged by promoting the innovation and learning culture and competence building culture. It, uh, we need uh, Chris Freeman's new economics of hope to deal with and respond to Africa's problems, to bring parallel solutions to all the varied problems Africa faces. So we need the courage to search and discover in order to apply the innovation system to bring all uh, the solutions uh, to make really the livelihood of the people and the nature of Africa to be uh, uh, really uh, done very well. So the one of the points I wanted to just mention to you is that the national system of innovation has been developed in South Africa. The first time after 1994, when the new government came, the post-apartheid government came. In 1996, they did, uh, they developed the, the national system of innovation. And the, the, in, at that time, the, it was called the Department of Arts, Culture, Science and Technology. DACST was supposed to be the one that was running the, the national system of innovation. But in 2002, this uh, linking of arts and culture with science and technology and innovation was separate. They separated it. And, uh, and uh, then they created what is called the Department of Science Technology and DST. And uh, it's DST that is, uh, uh, and that was formed in 2004. So, uh, what they did was they did, what they did was when they developed the national system of innovation, they say, how could we prepare? All right, that's what they said. They wrote it in 9, September 1996. They say, what should we do to bring to develop South Africa to achieve both two things they did: one, internal difficulties they have, how do we manage that? Two, how do we deal with the global economy? In, in what way can we bring in a national system of innovation to address these issues? That's how they tried to develop it. So they have been working on it. They have now done three white papers, 1996, 2008, and 2000, 2008, and, 2000, uh, 2008 and, and 2018. And in the, in the first one in 1996, with one of the key advisors was uh, our Chris Freeman. He actually participated. 
participated in the formulation of the, I wish you could look at the papers very well uh, articulated, and it wasn't taken with the OECD part, it was actually tried to be contextualized in the African part. He actually did the uh, contribution. I remember him because I used to, he used to tell me about going to South to, when he was coming. So he did, uh, he did that. Luckily, when they did the 2008 and uh, uh, 2018, uh, we were also invited. So I, I participated also in the discussions. So we have been working on it, but still, still, I must say to you, it's a very interesting thing what they are doing in South Africa, but still the challenges are more than what the national system of innovation has done. So I think I like a uh, discussion with all of you today where we can reflect not just on uh, simply the national system of innovation for South Africa, but as a whole, how do we bring in also the whole of Africa to make sure that we utilize innovation system to actually create the African future and to build it further and more. So I like you very much to be very uh, inspiring and very challenging and pro very provocative and looking forward very much to hearing from you and very excited. Thank you very much, uh, my brother, uh, uh, Abdel Qadir. Please uh, give the floor to you please go and share it in, in your interesting way. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mamou, for these few introductory words. And of course, putting uh, the South African uh, experience into a retrospect, into a, a historical perspective, which is an important, it is important to know the stages. And I think quite few African countries have gone more or less through uh, difficult stages, but they have been going through to try to develop learning capabilities and innovation systems. So thank you for uh, introducing these already important issues and for mentioning also the uh, Chris and the work he did for uh, South Africa. So I am uh, very pleased today, of course, and uh, uh, to be invited to chair this panel session and uh, Thank you, Mamou, and thanks, uh, uh, Rajesh, and thanks for the organizers. Uh, briefly, um, I'm the Kader Jeflat. I'm uh, from Africa, I'm from Algeria, <laughs> <laughs> where I spent the first uh, part of my life uh, trying to do uh, to and do research on these issues of science and technology. And the second half uh, in uh, France, where I've been also teaching and researching on these uh, issues about innovation and development. I've had the opportunity to also initiate with uh, colleagues uh, a network of science, technology, and innovation policy in the North African uh, region, which is called Maghreb Technology, MacTech. And of course, through, uh, it has now almost 20, more than 25 years old. And through that network, we've been able to exchange experiences and uh, to reflect also on various issues linked to uh, science, technology, and innovation and development of African countries. And uh, I had the, the privilege to write one of the chapters, chapter 10 uh, of the book, Putting Africa First. And uh, thanks to Mamo and Ben Toki, you invited me and attended that conference, uh, to, which started this the whole process of Publix and the book. Uh, and uh, I find it, this is a valuable opportunity for me also to reflect and see how I could rewrite it 18 years later. Uh, I think uh, I haven't had the chance actually, Mamo and other colleagues to meet Chris uh, whenever I was, I went to uh, school, I wasn't there, and, uh, but I had so much about him through common relations. And in particular, two of his friends, Jeffrey Oldham and Martin Bell, whom I had the privilege to work with on various projects. So in a sense, I know him indirectly, but, and of course I read his work uh, subsequently and, of, with, and discovered uh, the depth of his uh, uh, thinking and his uh, humanism and his depth, uh, the long-term view and of course, uh, as somebody said, he's the bridge man, bridging between history and bridging levels of decisions and bridging, bridging also between uh, fringes of society. That is a very 
exceptional uh, thing to have and it's only Chris could have it. Today we are meeting to panel three uh, uh, around the, th the theme of the application and use of the innovation system concept to African sustainable and integrated development, uh, which is linked to part two of the book, Putting Africa First. And uh, as you may have seen, which included four important chapters on various aspects of application. So uh, from the concepts, which we looked at uh, last time, we are going to application to see effectively how effective innovation systems concept have been and whether they've been to promote, being able to promote uh, innovation for sustainable development. Uh, to address this important issue question, uh, we have uh, uh, seven brilliant researchers Distinguished colleagues, Alan Freeman, who will uh, uh, do the inaugural address, uh, Angabas Karan and Judith and Jesse, Sean, Andrew and Biran, all each of them address one aspect of uh, these issues related to application. And uh, you could see, we we'll see they are really complementary and very, very uh, rich in terms of learning and in terms of uh, cross fertilization of various aspects of uh, the issue uh, of uh, learning and uh, ca building capabilities in learning and uh, innovation system for sustainable development. Uh, I believe that the, uh, since we wrote Putting Africa First, we had several meetings around African development and innovation issues. But I consider that one of the first landmarks was the seventh Global X conference in Dakar in 2009, where a group of us noted that Africa may uh, have another path than simply trying to get the national systems innovation, uh, of innovation for catching up, at least in the medium term. It would have, it has what some called at the time uh, specificities for pre-catch-up policies to get innovation off the ground. And uh, uh, of course, while recognizing its huge potential in unrecognized innovation and capabilities, usually referred to as uh, below the radar or social poor, uh, it couldn't remain excluded from what we may say above the radar and uh, at the risk of being internally in, uh, eternally locked in a new form of STI division of labor. Africa, uh, putting Africa first, or Africa is also seeking to promote industrial development as we did, as we stressed it in, in, in the introductory panel, creating jobs, value added, competitiveness in the global and globalized value chain. And of course, with higher, with knowledge and uh, products and services with higher knowledge intensity and being fully inserted in the digit, digital age into knowledge economy and the fourth industrial uh, uh, revolution. So uh, it, it needs to uh, develop capabilities and learning to meet entrepreneurship, the formidable drive, uh, formidable drive of youth to push for startups, including at policy level, incubation processes, the rising and now dominant concept of a thriving ecosystems, and we discussed that last time uh, on the Chris Freeman meeting, and which seems to have been massively absorbed by key players as opposed to the national system of innovation. But of course, uh, the continent has its own specificities with its history, the heritage of colonial exploitation, struggle for independence, and as mentioned by, by Chris, and the uh, importance of ad and of course the impact of structural justice. So implementing innovation systems need to take into account specific historical, geopolitical, territorial conditions, and they are essential to explain which and how product and innovation capabilities should be acquired. And this is what we will try to do. Therefore, as says uh, Lundval, they are implementing a static framework of innovation systems would be adventurous uh, and of course, uh, full of risk for the uh, development of Africa. 
And we also had the opportunity to look at these problematics at territory level and indicated that the mode of emergence of innovation dynamics can be quite different and possibly sometimes not even systemic. So we had to really examine them, analyze them, and see what alternatives Africa could seize to see emerging innovation systems as we proposed uh, as an alternative. So uh, the panel uh, today will address many of these aspects and uh, to reflect uh, and reflect on the various dimensions of the implementation or application of innovation systems. Uh, to do that, we will start, I uh, will call on uh, Alan Freeman, Alan, uh, who will address the issue of, uh, uh, the title is uh, relation between the three concepts of development, innovation, and imperialism in Christopher Freeman's work. And uh, he will, of course, uh, examine uh, the issues of uh, imitating uh, the uh, strategies pursued in the North and, of course, differentiating. Alan, uh, briefly, uh, is cultural economist. He's formerly a principal, uh, uh, he was formerly a principal economist with the Greater London Authority. He is a visiting professor at London Metropolitan University and research fellow at Queensland, uh, Queensland University of Technology in Australia. He's co-editor of the Future of the World Capitalism book series and the critic of Political Economy COP, an online, online journal of critical economics. He's also committee, uh, a committee member of the Association for Heterodox Economics and the vice chair of the World Association for Political Economy. Alan, the floor is yours for uh, about 15 to 20 minutes. There you go. So let me just check that everybody can hear me okay. Is that fine? The microphone's working very good. I'm fine. putting two, um, two website addresses in the chat. And uh, the first of these is the Christopher Freeman Memorial website on which Rajesh has been doing absolutely sterling work. And this is preparing, of course, for the uh, 100th anniversary of my father's birth on September the 11th, fateful day, uh, 1921, and the memorial year that follows, at the end of which we hope to produce a reader called The Essential Chris Freeman, a reader of Chris's works with testimony from many of his colleagues, alumni, and those who recognized his worth. And the second is um, really a bit of a plug. I'm working on this with my partner, Radhika Desai. It's a, an international collaboration, which I think would be of great interest to anybody who's interested in South-South relations. And uh, you might like to go and look at it. There is much in it which is controversial, as we have found, but there is much in it which I think is uh, shedding interesting new light. And I would very much hope that you as scholars will be able to contribute to this emerging rich discussion on uh, the, the, the new situation in the world. So I'm, second thing I'm gonna do is just share a screen. Uh, I won't get to this till quite a while, but um, it, you can sort of meditate on the graph I'm gonna show you while I'm talking. And this is a, a very simple graph, if I can get it to display. It's my, my own, oh goodness, it's gone again, yeah, okay. Um, measure of North-South inequality. And this is the GDP per capita of the global North divided by the GDP per capita of the South in current, current money uh, in U, current US dollars at market exchange rate. So it's not PPP, it's money. It's what you can actually buy on the world market with your output. And uh, one of the key things about this graph is it shows that from 1980 onwards, inequality, which is this ratio, massively increased. Furthermore, its trend has been an increasing trend in the post-war era. And this runs contrary to the predictions of neoclassical theory, but supports, I will argue, the arguments of the um, early developmentalists and dependency theorists. So that's uh, the background to what I'm going to say. Now I begin with thanks and an apology. Mamo's earnest entreaties have made me your inaugural speaker, but I'm not a specialist in your area. 
So I will offer some broad remarks combining my knowledge of my father's works with my own studies on the causes of international inequality. And I start with the relation between three concepts of development, technology, and imperialism as they appear in Chris's works. And I start with three facts about this work. First, Chris was asked to become a commander of the British Empire in 1994. He turned this down on the grounds he did not regard it as an honor to accept any title that celebrated empire. Second, there are several versions of Chris's work on the Third Condratia. The earliest was written around 1987, published in a volume edited by Bolin and entitled The Third Condratia Wage, Wave, Age of Steel, Electrification and Imperialism. In later versions, the words heavy engineering substitute for steel and the word imperialism disappears. These versions were surely adopted for audiences, which is not a fault, but deprives us of the full scope of the thinking that lay behind them. The third fact as well known is that Chris regarded technology as critical to development, as people already said. His long association with Jeff Oldham, the intimate connection between SPRU and the Institute of Development Studies led to the so-called Sussex Manifesto of the United Nations. In, um, this was a, charted out in a seminal UN paper with Jeff Oldham and Erwin Tukjan on the transfer of technology to developing countries with special references to licensing and know-how agreements. And Ergun testifies on the memorial website, which I've shown you, that this was immensely important to Chris. In my opinion, it should be celebrated as a seminal contribution to the developmentalist literature. The question posed by these three facts is, are the requirements of a suitable technology policy posed uniformly across all national states or differentially, in particular, for the former colonial and semi-colonial countries on the one hand, and those countries known as the Global North, which at the end of the third Condratia had achieved both economic and industrial parity with each other and a share in the fruits of world dominance. So in particular, should the technology strategies of the Global South be pursued, perceived as a mere imitation of the Listian policies of the second wave industrializers, Germany, Japan, and the USA, or as a different strategy taking account of the persistent monopoly of high technology now shared after a century of fratricidal conflicts between all those nations that emerged from World War II as beneficiaries of a general system of economic domination from which all the former colonies and semi-colonies were excluded. The question is directly related to the simple question, is today's global north simply a continuation in modified form of the imperialism of the third Condratio? These confront us with the more complex underlying theoretical question, what is the essence of imperialism? The superficial similarities between Listian and developmental technology policy lie clearly in their use of the state to develop the economy. Chris paid deep attention to the economic philosophies of List and Hamilton, who were both strong advocates of state protection of infant industries and an active role for the state in investment and innovation. So did he regard the technologies of the third Condratio of USA as a mere model to be dissected intellectually and form a kind of kit of parts for pragmatic insertion into the development strategies of the third world? I think not. Chris's thinking requires that development, developing countries, whilst learning what they can from the experience of the USA, Germany and Japan, require very distinct technology strategies corresponding to their different insertion into the world political economy. This is for two reasons. First, the earliest industrializers, the Netherlands, Britain and France, associated with the first and second Kondratievs, enjoyed the unprecedented and never repeated opportunities offered by their colonial system. The second wave industrialized in and through a challenge to this advantage, but not just to the technology of them, but to their colonial advantages. This dictated the specific forms of innovation which were driven by the imperatives of expansion, conquest, subordination, and militarism. 
Even if we thought it morally desirable to imitate this model, it is today not possible in a world of sovereign nations. But second, these two groups of industrializers, notwithstanding their different origins, have constructed a jointly shared monopoly of high technology, which they organize to protect by all means at their command. Therefore, the states of the South require a different type of strategy directed to the political achievement of economic independence. In my opinion, that is why the issue of technology transfer was paramount in the Sussex Manifesto and early year interventions of Chris and Jeff and Urban into the debates of the United Nations, and why today the issue of technology parity must be the primary imperative. Now, what does imperialism have to do with this? To many writers about empire, outside the narrow circuits of the Marxian left, imperialism is a forgotten and finished phase of world history, which we've, we've gone beyond that now. We're living in a new liberal era of Pax Americana, or even it's a kind of political epithet, devoid of economic content, which can be conveniently hurled at any antagonist, as Reagan did with his concept of evil empire. But the question of imperialism arises quite simply because in a capitalist world system, domination takes a primarily economic, not a primarily political form. This is enforced, this is of course reinforced politically through a range of measures ranging from the lending conditionalities of the financial institutions, treaty arrangements like NAFTA and the Lomé Convention, all the way up to the systematic use of coercive sanctions to achieve regime change extraterritorial assassinations, lawfare, and wars of intervention. These politico-military politico financial facts, however, can be misunderstood if we treat them as the primary mechanism of domination, rather than the mere means of policing and enforcing the essential mechanism, which is economic. Imperialism therefore interposes itself in the following way. How are we to explain the huge disparities of income and development which arose with the great divergence and which gave birth to the new imperialism and of which Chris speaks. But second and far more important, how can we explain why they persist? According to neoclassical trade and growth theory, these should have dissipated through the workings of the world market. Actually, as my graph shows, and of many others have commented, Inequality is now higher than ever when conceived of as the difference between the two principal blocks of the world, the global north and the global south. From this, by the way, I excerpt China, and I don't have time to discuss China here, although it's clearly highly relevant, and I excerpt the transitional countries for reasons of data and uh, uh, consistency over a long period of comparison. So we're just talking about the global north and the global south without China and the transitional countries. Um, now, according to Trove and Growth Theory, that this difference should have dissipated, but they're now higher than ever, and they reach their greatest extent, as we can see from this graph, in the neoliberal years, when the market was the closest possible to the ideal of neoliberal theory, and they should have produced convergence. So the facts confirm the predictions and theories of the early developmentalists and dependency theorists, today ignored by mainstream theory, namely, the unrestrained forces of the market, world market, produce endogenous divergence, not endogenous convergence. They do so, I suggest, because as noted by Lenin, whose collected works adorn two shelves in my father's study and are now adorned two shelves in mine, and whose theoretical contribution has been rescued in a seminal doctoral theorist thesis by Sam King, they perpetuate a permanent and self-reinforcing monopoly of high technology in the imperial powers. This is maintained by the phenomenon of unequal exchange as diagnosed by Prebish and Singer and analyzed at length by the dependency theorists. That is to say, the disparities are perpetuated, not dissipated by the natural endogenous mechanisms of the market itself. This is why the imperative of today's technology policy must be the pursuit of technological parity. But the acquisition of technological parity, as the current US offensive, US offensive against China clearly shows, is precisely that which the northern nations most fear. This fear is irrational. The result would be a much greater world supply of advanced products, including not least green products, which would greatly benefit the consumers of the north. 
However, there is a material rationality, which is that such an advance would undermine and quite possibly eliminate the privileges enjoyed by the major high tech and financial conglomerates of the North. For this reason, the pursuit of technological parity can expect to meet fierce resistance and cannot be imposed with the same ease that accompanied the rise of the Edison Electrical Company, the Bethlehem Steel Corporation, or the skyscrapers of New York and Chicago, which so impressed my father. Therefore, any who wish to pursue such developmental policies should not expect to encounter merely academic opposition. Notwithstanding, the academic opposition is quite prodigious, requiring us to gird our theoretical loins. Such policies directly contradict the Washington Consensus. This is based on the Ricardian theory of comparative advantage, but actually in a modified form, since Ricardo's theory was expressed in terms of labor values, but was restated as a theory of factor allocation by Habela in 1930. And this advises the global north to specialize in high technology and the south in raw materials and cheap labor. The switch and bait of this conversion is that labor could, of course, be used to produce high tech, but cloth cannot be used to make wine, nor can wine be used to make cloth. The Habela version of the theory is hence a direct prescription that the North should not develop a labor clause capable of deploying and using the most advanced technology available in the world today, but should leave that to the North. The entire strategy imposed on the global South South by the North since 1980 depends for its justification on this theoretical foundation. So what is its actual effect? May I just check with the chair if I have any time left now at this point? Yes, you could go ahead for another couple of minutes if you want. Okay, in that case, I'm going to skip to the graphics in this. Now, the key point, as I hope you've realized by studying this graph, is the spectacular rise of inequality up until 2002. Now, in a triumphalist intervention uh, by the brief financial minister of Turkey, when he was still at the World Bank, this fall in international inequality was proclaimed to be a new era of convergence. These hopes were rapidly dashed in 2012 when inequality resumed its upward climb and started furthermore from a level which is actually, if you look at it, twice as high as at the end of the Second World War and still higher than at the beginning of the neoliberal era. What is the reason for this monetary disparity? And uh, the discourse of uh, PPPs has taken the place in many senses of, of this disparity in current incomes, largely because the uh, if you examine current dollars, which is what you can actually get for your output on the world market, the facts show the World Bank and the IMF in a much worse light. So here's the same graph, but showing PPP as uh, and the current dollar exchange, uh, sorry, uh, relation. Well, it's obvious that things look much better in terms of PPP, but why is that? It's because what happened during the neoliberal years is that the output of the North, of the South, increased prodigiously, but the price of that product fell. That's why you have the reversal of 2012 to 2001 too, sometimes attributed to the super commodity cycle, because the conditions of production in the South were so undermined by the neoliberal prescriptions that they were unable to produce in the same quantities and the price of these raw, raw materials began to rise before recovering uh, to their former levels of, of, of low levels uh, as began in 2012. Now, what you actually find, and this is an extremely interesting graph, is that the terms of trade mean that capital goods compared with domestic goods are much more expensive in the South than in the North. So the South has to devote all its effort to acquiring this high technology instead of producing it itself. And that is what is maintained by both the market and the exogenous interventions I would maintain of that we've discussed the conditionalities and treaty uh, arrangements, uh, the interventions and so on. So I'll finish on, this is a graph I produced in, well, it, it refers to 1996. Every red circle on this is a Southern country. Every black cross is a Northern country. On the vertical axis, we have GDP per capita. 
On the horizontal axis, we have the price level. That is PPP output divided into current output, simple measure of price level. We find the world is neatly divided into two quadrants. In the Northeast quadrant, we have the high price, high income countries of the North. And in the low, in the, in the low income, low price quadrant, we find all the countries of the South. In short, we find exactly the same division of the world as existed at the time of the third Kondratia. It has not changed in 100 years, with the exception of China, and with the exception still underway and still not clear of what has happened to the previously socialist countries of the Soviet bloc. So this is the reason that I believe that Christopher Freeman's first version of the theory of the third Kondratia, with the uh, accompaniment of Imperialism as a component part in understanding what drove the third Kondratiev is an essential element of our, the understanding we need today. So I thank you very much for your time uh, and look forward to hearing the contributions of the other speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. I think it's a, a very, very interesting and very useful to uh, put these uh, issues in a long term to the third Kondratiev and uh, to remind us some of the structural problems which probably are not easy to overcome by the global south and the uh, uh, potential uh, uh, conversions which uh, a lot of people uh, might advocate might be uh, maybe uh, more and more remote because of disparities being uh, uh, extreme and being uh, magnified as we go along because of, uh, of uh, a certain number of mechanisms which we clearly explain. I think we leave the, uh, the, uh, the discussion for, for the end and uh, uh, I will go on to the next uh, speaker uh, who is uh, Anga Baskaran. So uh, Baskaran is uh, 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 addressing the theme of fostering rural digital economy and inclusive innovation to combat poverty in African countries. In other words, he's addressing uh, the question, uh, will Africa miss the demographic dividend in the new context of digital economy? Uh, Vaskaran uh, is an associate professor at the Department of Development Studies Faculty of Economics and Administration, the University of Malaya. He has several books and publications and it's many things. He's also a senior researcher associate at Saatchi, which is Innovation and Development, Chuan University of Technology in Pretoria, South Africa. And as every one of us, he is also a knows, he is editor in chief of African Journal of Science, Technology, Innovation and development. Bas, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Abdul Kader. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, thank you, Abdul Kader. I like to Thank Mamu and uh, Rajesh for organizing this wonderful event, a series of uh, panel discussion, uh, and uh, being one of the contributors to putting Africa first. It's a very, you know, uh, uh, so I, I'm delighted to revisit uh, what I wrote and also reflect on uh, other, other writings. So thanks for Alan to set out the, the, the problem in today's world, the, the you know, higher inequality widening gap between North and South. And that's a good backdrop for my own presentation. So I'm going to talk, uh, I'm, before just starting, I would like to say that uh, I was so fortunate to, uh, as a student of SPRU at Sussex University, Personally, no, uh, you know, Chris uh, enjoyed his making con conversation with him. 
listening to his uh, wonderful comments during our seminars and events and you know last uh, we myself and mamu visited him some months before he passed away uh, he was still very sharp so i was very fortunate about uh, you know that uh, i just want to introduce how i got myself uh, you know introduced to this concept innovation system we all know that innovation system is something uh, it makes central institutions histories territories technologies and country specific nature of the concept and which the mainstream economics consider residue and according to lundwall the modern version of this concept was first used by chris in uh, unpublished document uh, prepared for oecd in 1982 later lundwall used it in his uh, you know work on producer user interaction and learning in 1985 and chris expanded this idea into more discussion in his uh, analysis of japanese economy uh, in 1987 and I, the books by by lundwall and richard nelson in 1992 93 that's when i was a student at spro so i was there to do a thesis on export control regimes on technology transfer uh, i was working on india space program so that was actually a cold war uh, regime to stop east west technology transfers and used against countries like india so that's when i got in, into this uh, when i read this books i was really fascinated i used it to frame my own thesis into you know the context of india uh, I, i i framed it like duality in innovation system national system of india indian national innovation system and i also looked at two phases of india's uh, development before india opened up its economy 1991 and after how institutions were different how various relationship was different so i just framed it like you know inward looking nsi and outward looking nsi so that's where i i was introduced this concept and i adopted it uh, i think the putting up your first was again an attempt by mamu and his other our colleagues to apply this to the context of africa i am reflecting on two chapters one is chapter 2 12 by shulingu she talked about innovation system and and endogenous development a perspective of asia for africa basically she looked at the experience of korea and taiwan and she identified what the african countries can learn from and what they should not try to learn so for example she is talked about the government role in promoting technological capabilities not as a counterweight to market but as a driver of coordinating agency and also how to develop efficient institutions of governance of innovation system so she identified these are the things africa could learn however they should develop their own style of institutions suitable to their own history historical background and social background and she also said the the new industrializing nations made a mistake by not balancing agricultural rural development with manufacturing and technology accumulation so that's what she, then at the end she uh, suggest uh, africa should not would not wholly imitate it so that's her conclusion so in a way today i'm going to talk about some of the issues uh, how africa could learn something what's happening in china today but my conclusion is going to be same like what shuling is said long time ago the second chapter is our own chapter i myself and mamu we wrote towards the national uh, african national system of innovation lessons from india as i said we looked at india's 
uh, experience in two different phases before uh, liberalization in 91, after 91. And our conclusion was that the main lesson for Africa is that Africa must learn from India is to create unification of unified nation within which a system of innovation can be embedded regardless of the imperfect of this. So India has not really developed a perfect national innovation system, as I mentioned to you. It's a, there's a lot of, there are sectors which are islands of excellence, but there are sectors very backward. So that was, that was the time how to learn something for India. So India has internalized external knowledge and technology to its national context, which is interesting for Africa to learn from. So there are certain things which uh, I, we identified Africa would learn from. So now coming back to what I'm going to talk today is poverty and unemployment in Africa and how uh, digital you know, economy or digital technologies could enable to play a role in reducing or combating this unemployment poverty. See by, in 2021, currently, there are 490 million people in Africa living in extreme poverty. That's 36 of total population. It's really huge. Countries like Nigeria and South Africa, which are largest economies in the continent, nearly two, one in two young people between the age of 15 and 34 without job. South Africa unemployment rate is the highest in the world now. So this is really serious problem. If you look at the unemployment rate across Africa, at least 10, 15 countries, over 20% unemployment. And you look at the population, it's the youngest population in the world. Africa is the world's 60% of population is under 25. And the next decades, it's expected to expand this young population meaning the working age population is going to grow. However, the question is, it is an asset if you really utilize it. So if you use it, it's a demographic dividend. Huh? It's going to help your economy. It's going to translate into higher economic growth and so on. However, if you don't address those problems which are causing the high unemployment and poverty, Africa is going to miss out on demographic dividend. So the, the idea here is, is there any role for digital technologies to help rural economy? So like Sulingu has said, you know, Asia did not pay attention to balancing rural development with, with the manufacturing. I think China has been doing it in the last, I think, 10 years, uh, particularly, uh, especially using digital technologies. So that, that I thought maybe have some lessons for Africa. It's not all the strategies, uh, you know, are dependent on digital technology. They have followed multiple stages, strategies for addressing poverty and all. However, uh, digital technology plays a major role in their, you know, strategies. So it, it's good to look at how, what they are doing. So digital economic components like government policy regulation, internet, worldwide web, electricity infrastructure, telecommunication industry, universities, digital service providers, e-business, e-commerce industry, IT management system, intellectual property, digital literacy, that's the most important thing as well and knowledge workers. So th these are the components. So there's a lot of research into how digital technologies can support rural areas to become more economically and uh, socially viable and sustainable. There's plenty of uh, research going on around the world. So in this particular, I would I'd like to focus on are there some lessons for Africa from China? So the most important thing to me China has done a lot of things in the last 30, 40 years. To me, their single most achievement is reducing or eradicating poverty. 
over 770 million people are left out of poverty. By February 25th, China de declared eliminating extreme poverty is completed. There may be some pockets of uh, poverty still there in the country, but it's not stock and it's not really, you know, kind of uh, widely prevalent. The last hundred million was the hardcore poor. From 2012 to 2020, over 100 million people were lifted out of poverty through targeted poverty alleviation scheme. And about 832 counties, which were considered poor, were completely eradicated from poverty. And China did comprehensive strategy, not just the information and digital infrastructure, it's also many other things like electricity, drinking water, communications, uh, road building. Huh? Uh, they, they put together uh, and also in terms of new model of uh, development, they brought e-commerce to rural areas. They expanded solar PV and tourism. So it's a, it's a comprehensive strategy. So I will just focus on digital infrastructure building. Now, 98% of poor villages have access to optical fiber communications and 4G technology. There's barely any difference between internet speed in urban and rural areas. Distant education is available at most schools in impoverished areas. Telemedicine e-commerce cover all designated poor counties that 280, 32 counties, sorry, 800. So this is happening in a rapid pace. The same time, this facilitated innovative, you know, 1,290 innovative platforms and business startups. Uh, a lot of uh, poor people have been paired up with professionals to receive guidance. Again, individual entrepreneurs have been developed and encouraged to start their own businesses and help others. So there are a lot of strategies have been followed. Rural income, uh, to increase rural income, they piloted e-commerce projects in 2014 across the many poverty-stricken villages. By 2020, all the 832 villages, are, sorry, counties are covered, yeah. One minute to All right, okay, okay. So th this is uh, the kind of thing they did. The, then the per capita income of poor people from e-commerce increased from RMB 430 to 930, just from e-commerce income. Yeah? So th there are so many things. Uh, it's possible because of the e-platforms. There are e-platforms like Tabo, uh, which is part of Alibaba, and they call it Tabo Villages, which uh, you know are adopting a lot of villages in the e-platform. E and the other companies like Pin, Duo, Duo, TikTok, Paisho. So other e-commerce platform, we know Alibaba is very well known. There are so many other things. So online, it created 28 million jobs in rural China. And a lot of financial, inclusive financial uh, products were introduced to rural China. So in conjunction with that, the solar PV technology was expanded to villages. Government funded building solar PV stations, which are owned by villages. Now over 100,000 villages have PV station generating RMB 200,000 for each village. And looking at Africa, 50 million people live without electricity. 10% of individuals have no access to electricity at all. Less than 2% of rural population in Malawi, Ethiopia, Niger, and Chad have access to electricity. So the solar PV has great role to play. And according to International Energy Agency, the right policies, solar should become one of the continent's top energy sources. So this information infrastructure and solar PV infrastructure go hand in hand. So 
to conclude yes china's experience showed digital technologies can play a major role in combating unemployment and poverty help increase rural income in african countries however as shulin you portion in her uh, chapter in putting africa first africa should learn from others experience but adopt its own strategies and which is suitable for its own historical and social background africa should not and could not wholly imitate it so that's uh, my presentation uh, uh, yeah thank you thank, thank you uh, Baskaram, thank you very much for uh, bringing these very important issues of the demographic dividend and uh, the link with the uh, digital economy. I think these uh, are probably uh, big issues and how can we uh, uh, use the digital economy to really transform that uh, demographic di 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 uh, dividend into uh, 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 with impact on uh, development and of course uh, cre employment creation and on knowledge and uh, the, and 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 the creation of, of wealth to the um, the people as a whole thank you we will come back to these uh, issues because of the not uh, imitating but adapting actually uh, models which have worked elsewhere according to uh, africa's reality is a key issue in my view when we address this issue of innovation systems and African context. Thank you. And uh, as time uh, runs, of course, we will be going uh, straight to uh, uh, Judith, Judith and Francis uh, uh, with us. She was a little late, but she's here. Uh, she will be uh, addressing the theme of innovation systems approach and agricultural transformation relevance opportunities and the way forward. I think uh, we are still in the rural areas and the agriculture to some extent, so we'd probably complete what uh, Bas just uh, said. Uh, Judith is... Uh, uh, is a senior program coordinator, science and technology policy at the Technical Center for Agriculture and Rural Cooperation, ACPEU, CTA in the Netherlands. And uh, she has be, been instrumental in the building uh, of capacity of women and young, prof young professionals in agriculture through the Africa-wide women and young professionals in science competition. Uh, Judith, the floor is yours for 12 minutes. Thank you. Judith? Are you hearing me? Yes, we hear you. Go ahead. Okay. I am trying to, uh, I have my uh, presentation. I'm trying to share the screen. Are you, and, um, well, it seems that the screen sharing is not working. Uh, are you seeing it? Uh, I am not, I am, yes, we have the screen now. Okay, thanks a lot. Go ahead, yes. Yeah, and um, let me go to show the slides. Okay, so my presentation, um, I am getting just two seconds, sorry. Thanks, uh, thanks very much um, for inviting me to be part of this um, series. And like the two speakers uh, before me, uh, a lot of the work that we have been doing on agriculture innovation systems in terms of applying the innovation systems approach to agriculture is embedded in the work of Freeman, Lundvald, all these people. So just by way of background, how, um, how, uh, how we started. Uh, so some years ago, I was very much engaged in science and technology and promoting science and technology for development. But then I, I, the whole issue of innovation uh, became uh, at the forefront of, of the change. And I was attracted to the work that you knew um, in tech was doing, Mytelka and Banji, Oyeyinga and Andy Hall. 
And then I got the opportunity to work with um, CTA. So this is back in 2003 when all the, the scholars started converging about the need for um, changing the, the dynamics. So um, my presentation is going to focus on the work we have done in terms of bringing the innovation concept, systems concept to agriculture and rural development in Africa, Caribbean, and the Pacific, working in partnership not only with scholars like um, Banji and Lynn, but also with scholars in Europe um, and and with the ACP can in the ACP countries themselves. Uh, I'm going to frame the, the narrative. Boy, uh, I'm not the, the the presentation is not moving. I I don't. Okay, sorry. Okay. I'm going okay. to, yeah, thanks a lot. I'm going to frame the narrative in the context of the introductory chapter, um, putting Africa first, because this was also one of the, um, one of the major publications out around that time. There were several. So we had um, Lunva, um, at all in terms of putting Africa first, they were asking questions, what lessons can be learned from applying the innovation systems uh, concept in Africa, and can it be appropriated? And my presentation speaks to the issue of appropriation because um, the speaker before me, uh, Ab uh, Andrew, uh, I think I could pronounce his surname much better, emphasize that we should not import um, uh, the, 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 the models, but adapt the models to the, the context. And I think that this is one of the driving forces behind a lot of the work that we are referencing today. So some of the questions they ask, why innovation, why systems, why national, why innovation and competence building, why knowledge and learning? And I'm going to provide some, some answers. And I was glad that the previous speaker alluded to the issue of poverty in Africa. Um, I did not bother to, to put in the poverty st statistics, but I wanted to emphasize the stark reality of what we are dealing with is that further to the, the COVID situation, the FAO, um, uh, IFAD and partners Sophie report is saying that 282 million Africans go hungry, 1 billion cannot afford healthy diets. And this to me is very concerning in terms of the work we do and how it impacts change on the ground. So um, I, I think as we, we do our innovation systems uh, work, China is, is, is a good model in terms of what it was able to achieve. Um, Brazil was making um, inroads at the time when we were doing, we had started looking at some of the other Asian tigers. But what we are seeing now is back to the issue that Alan uh, raised, is this whole issue of monopoly of technology and disparities. So we're keeping this at the forefront of our discussion. So now you have um, our innovation systems book. So I told you our work started in 2003. And like the Putin Africa um, first um, book, it brought together, when we published this, 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 this volume, it brought together all the lessons from the work we had done on the ground in the ACP region plus the, the, the work of other scholars uh, uh, on, in, on systems, uh, innovation systems, um, networks, innovation platforms, etc. So we have captured all these lessons in this book, and this is what I am I'm going to feature. So what we did, so starting from all the literature that the previous speaker um, referenced and more, we got um, Union Intech to work with us in terms of how do we adapt this, and this is this is what we what we're talking about, appropriating innovations 
in agriculture. And agriculture is very complex, very, very complex. So it's not only about technological innovation, et cetera, but, and we are going to um, identify, but we needed to get the scholars and the agriculture experts, academicians, et cetera, to work together to embrace something that we could all live with in terms of applying the innovation systems approach in, in the agricultural and rural development um, um, agenda. And this was challenging. How we did it, we met, we discussed, we, we, we had training workshops, uh, what, those multi-stakeholder dialogues with the leaders of agricultural research institutes deans of faculties of agriculture, deans of science, and everything else. And we came to a compromise in terms of what um, the relevance of the innovation systems approach and what we thought the agricultural innovation system looked like. And this is um, also featured in, in, in the publication, um, Mytelka and Banji and, 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 and all the, the partners we did a lot of work, and, but this is what we were able to accept. And why I'm focusing on that, because it goes back again to what we were discussing previously, all the international property rights agreements, the international trade agreements, investment agreements. But normally when you phrase uh, agriculture, um, usually the community does not think about all of these things impacting on how the transformation should change. So we got the senior leaders of all these institutions to agree. And this was after about a week about the relevance of the innovation systems approach to agriculture. And we started our work then with the next in line. And then, so we moved from, if you want to call it international ACP EU wide to the regional Africa, Pacific, Caribbean, and then we went to the national. So it, 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 this is how the, the work um, uh, uh, progressed. And I should also say that we developed tools, methodologies for analyzing the system. We, we developed training material. For, uh, we, we developed um, strategies for engaging with policymakers. So as we trained people, they had to now go out into their national system work with policymakers, et cetera, to get them to understand what the innovation systems approach was all about. Then we also supported them to analyze the system, but we, because of the expense, if we try to do the whole system, we actually said, choose a commodity, choose a subsector that was a priority for, for your um, country, and then apply the innovation systems approach as was developed and the, and the methodology to analyzing the system and feeding the information back to the stakeholders. So some of the, 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 the lessons, and, and, and so we were discussing appropriation of the innovation system uh, approach, and I want to say it has not been easy because when you talk about agriculture, you have then people talking about the research and you have so many different um, scientific disciplines in, involved, you have extension, you have the, the, the trade aspects, etc. So trying to get researchers engaged in a process which is beyond their comfort zone uh, was, was challenging, but we did um, come up with some very interesting things. So I am uh, looking at lessons from the field, uh, how we appropriated the ISC. And what I have tried to do, given the time limit, is just to, to point you to reading some of the relevant chapters in, 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 in the book. Um, so conceptual issues continue to be contested and challenged, right? And, and, and as a result of that, I remember one, um, one senior researcher in Africa asked me, Judith, what are you trying to do, bamboozle Africans with, um, with these, well, what we call imperialistic concepts. Is and it, by the two end, minutes left. Okay, so I am almost finished. Question. Okay. Yes, go ahead. We have methodological issues to address, and we, 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 we identify the complexity of the, 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 the innovation. 
the sectoral systems within the bigger national system. So how it links to the national, regional, and the global. The challenges with science in terms of as the science advances, then you have private appropriation of knowledge. So you'll find that even expressed in examples. And then the issue of innovation platforms. The speaker before mentioned innovation platforms. Innovation platforms came out a lot as a space for learning and, and sharing um, um, knowledge. So our going forward, challenges and opportunities. Uh, we need to articulate the innovation systems approach, bigger picture, society and policy relevance. Some of the charts that we, we, we show, etc. Uh, all people want to know is, how does this make my life better? Policy want, makers want to know, will this policy impact on, on uh, if, for example, ICTs, and will the ICTs um, convince um, farmers to go a different way, etc., produce more food, and those sorts of things. Opportunities, we have the networks which are already established. We need to build on that. Look for policy windows, and SME's transformation is uh, a priority. Working with financiers, policymakers, um, etc., because they have to buy into the concepts that we are promoting and betting, and they, we also need their support in terms of the funding. Um, and I, I, this is your cost-effective research. It came up, and that was why we went with a case study approach. I'm almost finished, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that. And last but not least, the way forward. We have to continue to build IS capacity. I am passionate about it. I think the more people we have on board, the easier it is for us to get away from just technology trajectories, etc. We need to be inclusive. Lynn Mitelka's um, chapter will show you about the whole thing about energy transitions and, and, and engagement. And the whole book is about engaging with smallholder farmers. Accountability and transparency. I think after 17 years, 18 years, and we are still seeing how high poverty is malnutrition, something is there's a missing link, link. And of course, the methodological issues and how we share the results and deliberate with policymakers. I have tried it, I've seen it work, but I think the embedding, we need much more work. And, and for me, I don't want us to come back 10 years from now talking about high poverty, high unemployment. It needs to be embedded in the local context, owned by the stakeholders, and they need to be empowered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I am sorry. If I run out of time, please. Thank you attempt. very much. Thank you very much, Judith. Uh, sorry to rush you, but we are just uh, getting short of time. This is a very important uh, topic, I think, which uh, really uh, is uh, reminds us that it, uh, things are difficult on the ground because of multiplicity of actors. But on the other hand, you can get them uh, working when you have uh, you have gathered all the conditions and you have also taken the uh, involved all key key players in the and the innovation project in the uh, uh, and developing uh, this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, dynamic of appropriation of of, uh, of innovation systems and uh, I note also you have been uh, uh, and expressing the role of networking and innovation platforms, which are themes which come again and again, and probably is one of the uh, issue we will need to address uh, a little more in our future uh, research. We'll be, I will have a few questions, but we'll go back to you uh, in the uh, discussion. Thank you very much for this very, very rich experience. And, thank, you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, now I go to Jesse, uh, Jesse, who is uh, uh, addressing the theme of applying innovation system approach to urban studies. Now we leave the, uh, the world of uh, agriculture and rural development back to urban uh, problematics. And uh, uh, Jesse uh, has been uh, uh, is an African urban dweller and lifelong learner, as she calls herself. 
Uh, she was until recently the executive manager and programs at South African Cities Network, a peer-based think tank established by South Africa's largest cities to focus on improving urban, urban development and governance. And she previously worked with National uh, Treasury, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR, the Human Science Research Council, and the University of California, Los Angeles Advanced Policy Institute. She also co-edited uh, the Innovation Africa book series and was elected uh, not long ago as vice president of the Africa League's scientific board. Uh, Jesse, the floor is yours for 12 minutes. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm just trying to make sure I'm projecting here. OK. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, Jeff Latt and my brother. Um, I want to thank you and uh, obviously Prof. Mama for the invitation to be here today. Uh, and I think importantly, posthumously, to Chris Freeman, who I never got to meet, but who clearly inspired generations like, you know, leaders like Mamo, who was actually my PhD supervisor, uh, as well as uh, scholars such as myself, who have been inspired to uh, valorize the context we live in as subjects of study, but also to apply some of those ideas in, in different fields. So uh, as you can see, my work is actually focused on uh, urbanization and urban development. Uh, and I have done this largely um, in practice through working for South African Cities Network, which uh, works it's kind of like a think tank, works across uh, metropolitan areas in South Africa, but also the WIT School of Governance that uh, takes a governance lens on these issues and the African Center of city, uh, for Cities, which has then a continent-wide view, uh, focused largely on planning issues. Uh, I'd like to use my time to tell a short story and just how we are trying to apply some of the innovation systems concepts within that. So why have I focused on urban work so much other than the fact that I had the qualification to do so? Uh, urbanization is obviously a huge focus uh, globally, very important in Africa in particular, because as we are told that we're heading towards a planet that we thought was just 9 billion, we're now talking about a planet of 11 billion, which is, is, is really frightening by 2100. Uh, and it's projected that the majority of that, and specifically the urban growth, which is pegged at about 2.5 billion additional people living in cities, the majority of that being in Africa uh, and therefore in African cities. Uh, and of that, you know, we're talking about the 47 least developing countries being the ones that are growing and urbanizing probably the fastest. Um, I, I always like to say that's not necessarily a problem uh, because uh, which is a strange thing to say because we understand the history of cities and how cities have grown. Uh, they've grown, for, you know, we see the past dependencies in terms of how infrastructure decisions have led the type of growth, the resource situation, the spatial situation, the governance situation, how capital is deployed. Uh, but I guess what's become of far more uh, concern uh, are the concerns around overconsumption and biodiversity loss, the resource constraints, and uh, the, the role of the urban uh, as a very particular kind of consumer, uh, the vulnerability, so the social, the economic, the environmental stresses, again, that concentrate in the urban in quite particular ways. Uh, the concentration, I've just mentioned this doubling of total and urban population in places perhaps where it's most difficult and most stressed already. Uh, uh, in those ways. And then, of course, the volatility that comes with all of that. So some of these characteristics that we thought were great in terms of economies of agglomeration uh, seem to also be the same characteristics that can really lead to very volatile uh, sociopolitical, socioeconomic situations. So we study cities for these reasons. Uh, and, you know, as some of these cartoons show, uh, you know, we are studying this little phenomenon called cities at the left end here, while, in fact, we have these compounding uh, and, and really complex systemic crises that are sort of bashing uh, at these little places that are perhaps already growing unsustainably. So when we talk about sustainable development, this is clearly not a sustainable uh, situation um, as it stands. So what has our response been to this? And here I'm talking about a policy response. So in South Africa, we decide that smart cities is the way to go. And our president announces that we are going to start a new smart city just outside the city where I live. Uh, and it's going to look like this. Uh, and without going into my long story, and I do have a long story for anybody who wants to buy me a beer sometime, 
Um, <laughs> we often behave uh, uh, in this response as though the crisis we're responding to is for people who are like this, and I am probably people who look like this, where in fact the majority of our city looks more like this. Uh, and this is not often what our response speaking to, and therefore we call this a different kind of SOS, you know, the same old story rather than saving anybody's souls. Uh, and um, we end up with uh, repeatedly in the context of South Africa and increasingly in many African countries, exactly this kind of social response, uh, which I think is quite legitimate and, and warranted. So how do we respond to the fact that we are living in a country that uh, holds this title of being the world's most unequal country? This is a, a cover from just over a year ago. Uh, and yet we seem to be having responses that are in fact not that smart. Uh, how are we thinking about our systems? So jumping forward, you know, there are obviously responses to this kind of work. Uh, OECD has come up with, you know, how do we think about these ideas, you know, these tech-led ideas of smart, uh, in particular response to issues of exclusion and uh, inequality. Uh, and locally in South Africa as well, our Council for Scientific and Industrial Research has also been having these conversations. But often that battle, I think, in the case of the South African report, has still been trying to if you want, for a people first <laughs> approach to how we think of growth. In a way, it feels like a very old battle to still be having, uh, but uh, it clearly seems to be where we are. Now, what we as the little community of academic uh, uh, practitioner scholars that I'm part of uh, try to do, and this is work from the African Center for Cities, uh, is to really try and encourage the viewing of cities as dynamic systems. Yes, dynamic infrastructure systems, you know, uh, which are technically and scientifically engineered, uh, you know, and they're undergirded by fairly North centric, I would say, professional norms and standards for how cities should be and what city means and what cities should look like. Uh, but they're also socially embedded. Uh, and there are policy imperatives and legal requirements that set those parameters uh, and could be looked at in different ways to ensure both administrative justice fairness and equity, but also the realization of socioeconomic rights. And this is the kind of argument we're having, where we understand the flows and forms to both be flows of, if you want, material things, but also of data and things that allow us to do things perhaps differently than we have before, uh, and forms to not only be physical forms, but also institutional forms that do very particular things uh, in very particular ways. So I've found that my work increasingly has gone in the direction of institutional studies into the roles of administrative justice and the political economy uh, in really understanding how cities work. Importantly, South Africa has actually centered a systems approach uh, in, in its urban policies called the IUDF, the Integrated Urban Development Framework, in arguing for this kind of systemic view, this vir you know, virtuous confluence, if you want, uh, between the human, the environmental and the economic uh, in enabling what they refer to as the urban dividend. So I think earlier somebody referred to the demographic dividend. Here we also talk about the urban dividend. Uh, and this requires alignment and integration across key systems. Uh, and the main vehicles uh, for urban development are these, and they are also perhaps the transformative tools that can help us improve quality of life. So this is the kind of thinking we're doing uh, and trying to then use that. So this is a, a, a paper that uh, Judy Backhouse, who's a scholar at UNU from the information system side, uh, myself and my colleague Jokudu more on the urban side, uh, really trying to reframe uh, from what government centric view of smart tends to be that is one sectoral and two tends to very much layer technology in a very hard and pushy way uh, and we're trying to say, yes, absolutely, we're not technophobes. Obviously, we want to use technology, but could we start by contextualizing? Could we build up from an understanding of the development context and priorities that we actually have? Uh, can we then think about how to build a smart understanding, but also this idea of specific capabilities that enable us to work through this? So this is the kind of, uh, if you want, alternative framing uh, that we've been trying to drive that, that maybe, maybe centers institutions too much, but in our context, these institutions really matter. Uh, because they kind of decide uh, what should happen. So it's arguing as well for a view that's local. And in fact, this has been, a lot of my work has been trying to apply uh, innovation systems thinking to actually local innovation, you know, the, the local level. So whether it's the city level or even the community level, uh, and trying to say that there are things that can be done and should be done at that level. And yes, they can be supported by, and they should be supported by any ideas about a national system of innovation uh, that really does things more broadly. However, 
right now there's a very serious disconnect. I think there's really no connection at all almost between our NSI, which Mamo correctly says exists and has existed in South Africa for some time, uh, and these questions of local development and how cities think about smart cities and how they advance those agendas. So, so this is one of the links we're trying to make, uh, as well as sort of trying to argue that governance is not about government, in fact, and that over-centering just the role of government uh, it's, it, it's important, a government has a role to play, and, and I'll, I'll show just now quickly just two short studies we're doing that in fact try to look at the roles of government, but I just wanted to say that we are also really trying to clear that we're not trying to center government to the exclusion of other forms of governance and leadership uh, that are quite critical to how cities play out or any other space. Uh, I wanted to share these two studies very briefly and excuse the texty slides that will follow, but the one is a city we're trying to do where um, as I argued, you know, if we see cities and city networks as an increasingly important geography for thinking about innovation systems, we thought it would be useful to do some work that actually begins to reflect that uh, in a very data-driven way uh, on the continent. Uh, it's not been as easy as we thought. I had uh, run a, series, a previous project that looked at BRICS cities. Um, that, in a way, was easier because other countries have... <laughs> the data uh, at a city level that's comparable at a national level uh, and at a fairly high level one can do this uh, but when we're trying to get a bit more specific a bit more detailed uh, looking at Africa uh, and African cities uh, this has been quite tricky but we're basically trying to consider the innovation system if you want performance or even existence uh, in a few different African countries uh, but then to also look at that within their economic and innovation conditions so that we can begin to see uh, and, and ask some interesting questions from this. So this is very early stages and we're really struggling with it, to be honest, mainly for data reasons and comparability. Uh, but it's one of the two studies we are trying to drive. The second study is uh, uh, a little bit more advanced just because we're under pressure for a, it's driven by a book. Uh, and so we've sort of got to do this a lot faster. Uh, and this is a, a GIZ uh, driven uh, a project uh, done through the Southern Center for Inequality Studies. Uh, and there what we're trying to do is to say, um, if we believe that there's this potential for cities to actually play a role uh, in what this study is looking at, which is how do we develop, if you want, more inclusive economies? How do we have more inclusive growth in Africa? Then can we study whether these conditions at a local level, and particularly the role of local governments, is actually contributing towards that? Uh, this has been very interesting, um, and, 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 and in a way we've been picking up quite a bit from really extensive Brazilian work by Cassiolato and others in Brazil, uh, which is, is, is really quite interesting around local um, uh, innovation and production systems. Um, so the argument basically is that if we say innovation is increasingly the driver for development, and if I also claim that cities are increasingly driving that growth and development on the, con on the continent, uh, then what is the role of those local level actors and innovation systems in enabling inclusive growth if that's what's of interest? Uh, you know, in Africa so far, the focus has been very much on trying to build the NIS concept and much less so, like I said, this uh, LIS, you know, the local uh, innovation systems, uh, much less studied and much less data and work available. So we're asking these questions. We started by looking at uh, four cities. I can accuse our chair here of forcing us to one drop minute, four, one of one minute <laughs> okay. now he's attacking me, me because I'm outing him. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> one minute. No. Okay, thank you. I'm just about to finish. So it's been very tricky and very difficult. I mean, I, again, over a second beer, I can tell you why we dropped the Algeria case, but um, you know, we, it's very difficult to do this kind of work because the conditions absolutely matter, the timing matters, uh, uh, and um, it, it's one of the reasons this kind of research is quite tricky. But we will proceed with the three cities. Uh, early insights coming out of this is clearly, I've mentioned the research challenge. So there's limited contextual research. There are lots of conditions. One has to consider that data challenges are significant. Uh, there are in, what's coming out across the three that we're looking at is really serious government structure challenges. So the centralization of power and, and the fiscal, so very limited powers and functions, but also very limited resource available at local level for local governments to drive a particular kind of economy. So their steering role, other than provision of basic infrastructure, is very limited. Uh, complex and evolving local government architectures in two of the three countries we're looking at right now, it's literally changing as we speak into very, very complicated <laughs> formations that are very difficult to make sense of. Uh, and then, of course, power then focuses at the center because the rest is a bit of a mess. The inclination towards formal systems uh, and whether it's corporate or even when we talk about SMMEs, the fascination with startups and tech ecosystems rather than other more informal actors 
uh, is very present. Uh, I've mentioned the smart cities issue uh, and then very evident public sector constraints in terms of innovation thinking and capabilities to drive some of this. A lot of this is probably very similar to what faces the NSI. Uh, in our, my view, I think it's actually intensified or compounded at a local level uh, because of very serious, very vested interests that play out in very transparent and evident ways. Uh, I'll stop there, I think, just by yes. saying I think this work aligns. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks very much for the, this talk, which is pretty packed with ideas, issues, and uh, prospects for African innovation system, particularly at the uh, urban and local level. And uh, what I get from it, that the, of course, the uh, systemic approach, you can always uh, apply it, but provided, of course, you uh, uh, have the uh, grasp of all the uh, issues and all the actors who are involved in this uh, in the system and i was interested by uh, how you could uh, apply the local innovation uh, uh, the the uh, smart or oh, the local innovation system or you could figure out cities and uh, networks as a full uh, innovation system which is another way to approach it but of course we are in the context of uh, uh, emerging countries, which probably has its own specificities. And maybe if you address uh, these issues at uh, lower cities from the poor countries, issues might be uh, slightly different. We will probably go, go back to resettle it in the discussion. Thank you, uh, GC. Uh, and uh, we'll have to uh, rush. I call on Sean Cunningham to. Uh, like the floor, uh, who is addressing the uh, issue of perspective from innovation system practices. I think we go to the uh, the, work, the experience in the on the ground in the field, how to uh, harness it to enrich the thinking about uh, system perspective. And uh, Sean uh, is a process consultant working in the field of innovation and competitiveness improvement of the private sector. Uh, he's also a professor of practice with DST and RF Newton Fund Trilateral Chair in Transformative Innovation, the Fourth Industrial Revolution and Sustainable Development that is hosted by the College of Business and Economics at the University of Johannesburg. And he is also a faculty member of the University of Southern Boss Business School Executive Education Unit. Uh, Sean, the floor. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody, for still being here and for still listening. So um, as you've heard, I work a lot where I get sent to an organization or to a group of organizations. And very often, my job is to help people figure out how they can um, work with a system from where they are, which often means that you arrive there and you realize there are some things missing or some things are stuck. Or like Chris Freeman used to also point out, the history really matters. And it's not just about formulating a vision and, and um, you know, running towards an objective. We sometimes have to undo things and redo things and, and um, balance conflicting demands. So I'm not going to share a presentation. I want to share three and a half points um, and I'll explain the half at the end of the talk. My first point is about from subjects to participants. Um, what I've experienced when I work with stakeholders to try and promote and strengthen the innovation system is that there's a lot of focus on science and technology wherever I go. And I mean, it's easy it's easier because with science and technology, we very often have big programs. We have data, we can look at budgets, um, but what gets neglected is the emphasis on learning and innovating and, and particularly innovating in how we organize workplaces, how we organize production net networks, or how we organize the interactions between different institutions and different kinds of firms. So, of course, the efforts to strengthen our science and technology system across Africa should continue. This is really also relevant for those areas where and those domains 
where learning mainly takes place through science and, and maybe also where systems are stuck and, and there's no way to incrementally, um, you know, take things further. But there are downsides to this system. And I want to just highlight that one of the downsides is that the science and technology approach also involve fewer people. It costs more, it takes much longer, and it's more difficult to manage. And what we find in many um, innovation systems or clusters or sectors or um, locations is people are wondering, what are all those clever people in the institutions over there or in the universities or in the science labs doing? Because they're not doing anything for me. So what we have to also do in many places is we have to mobilize people towards local problem solving of the do use integrate um, mode. And it's not just about the people and the businesses, we have to take technological and educational institutions along. I see many projects that aim to directly work with enterprises coming from international organizations and international development cooperation or individual institutions and, and very often um, these efforts do not um, work. The people that we are trying to support in the innovation system often don't want to be taught. They want to be heard. And often the institutions that are supposedly there to support them are not able to do this. I mean, they, 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 they either have low credibility or they have low incentives to bother with businesses or with farmers or maybe they even look down at these um, entrepreneurs, at these farmers, at these innovators. So we need some intermediation to close the gaps between big firms and small firms, between small firms and small firms, between firms and institutions, and also between different kinds of institutions, different layers of policy making. So my point here is that we need to treat the systems and the actors not as subjects, but as participants. We have to take people along in this process. And we have to focus on these um, social elements. My second point is about two modes and two different kinds of traction. So as you all know, there's a lot of talk about technological change and technological disruption and the fourth industrial revolution and all the hype around that. I want to highlight two sets of technologies that I found really matter in my work. They are those technologies at the frontier. Um, I like Lynn Metelka's description of these as um, new wave technologies. And then those technologies that are widely disseminated in other places, but they are not taken up in the places where we are, in the place where we are focused. So let me first focus on those technologies at the frontier. It would be irresponsible to argue that we shouldn't be concerned about these, um, these frontier technologies. We, it would be irresponsible to advise any African government, or every insti any institution we are working with, not to, to be concerned about AI and 3D printing and any of these technologies. Where we have pioneers or the resources, we should encourage them to explore these technologies and, and we'll have to partner with other organizations um, you know, and, and because we cannot afford to get isolated and to be left behind. But what I'm finding in many places where I'm working is that a bigger concern are actually those technologies that are already proven in other contexts, but that have not been taken up in the place where we are. Now, some of those technologies, of course, can be a drone or 3D printing. So, so I'm not excluding those, but often what I'm finding is that quality management systems um, and many other manufacturing trends um, that you would expect to by now have made it to, to different parts of the world and to different parts of these countries, we find that those technologies are not there. We of course then have the challenge that the number of potential technologies that we have to cover is beyond the ability of most institutions. It, it's not unique to Africa this we find even in Europe and in the US and elsewhere that you would have many different institutions, sometimes even presenting or extending competing technologies to the same um, enterprises. What we often find in Africa is that technology extension is done, if it's done, technology extension is done 
many technologies from one institution. So what we have to do with these technologies, of course, we have to figure out how to select which ones. I have a suggestion about that, but we need to also demonstrate these technologies, which then means that the, in, the very institutions that we are working with also need to master these technologies. And there's so much emphasis on what enterprises have to master and so little focus on what the institutions have to master. So uh, that is um, you know, part of this point for me. Um, but I want to draw your attention somewhere else. And that is beyond the hardware and the skills programs and the capacity building programs, we really need to pay careful attention to the social technologies that we have to cultivate to make many of these technological arrangements work in our different workplaces. We're dealing with um, old hierarchies where we have hierarchies and we're dealing with low skills and we're dealing with many different challenges. So we really have to focus on those um, social technologies. It's very tempting and it's very easy to get caught up with the technicalities and then to forget the business models. And the fact that for one company or one enterprise to try something new typically has an effect on their suppliers, on those people that work with them and on their market. So, so it's also not just about the social technologies within the workplace, but also between these different um, workplaces. So where do we start? I mean, because now we are at the risk of technology push. And I mean, we all know in the 80s and the 90s how much was said about the technology push and, and why it doesn't work. I would suggest that we start by figuring out with our local institutions, what is it that potential innovators are struggling with? What is it that we can do to help these innovators and problem solvers and risk takers to figure out new things? And how can we help them to learn faster? It's always with my um, clients from the universities, they're always struggling because their first default setting is let's train them, let's teach them. And I have to say to them, no, what we have to do first is we have to listen. And as we listen to them, then we figure out maybe we need to give people access to a lab, or maybe we should go and do the experiment in their workplace. But let's not start by default by wanting to train people when sometimes all we have to do is join them and, and work um, with them. Um, many years ago, I used to take the academics that went with me to visit companies. I'd say everybody must come in overalls. And then we will equip them with a hard hat and with safety glasses to make sure that they don't look like professors, but that they look like um, participants in a lab. My third point is about broader understandings. Um, I mean, I think we in our community, we've spoken a lot over the time of the need to have a broader definition of technology. And that it's not just about hardware and software, but that we need this organization, this attention to organization. But as I read through um, the book in preparation for today, what struck me was Mario Seri's um, argument in chapter 11. It's on page 175, where he said um, that we should also broaden the understanding of an innovation system based on the strength of the innovation system. And this really caught me. Um, today's talk started with Mamo talking about South Africa. And, and the South African definition of the innovation system is very focused on the formal elements of the system. And it's actually looking at the whole world through the perspective of, of, of one um, government department. Um, but actually, if you go and you start looking at how other departments and how other policies and how other issues are affecting the ability of enterprises and the public sector to innovate, then you realize that we need a much broader um, definition of the South African innovation system itself. And this then counts for every other country. Um, you have to go and look at this paragraph that Mario wrote. He wrote, the less viable the innovation system, and I think with viable he meant scale, the more embracing our definition has to be. And then he ends by saying that this same principle applies to institutions, um, which I think is just amazing. My last, um, broadening of understanding is about learning. You have one um, minute, uh, Sean. Thank you. One so minute. there are many studies. 
looking at absorptive capacity and education and learning. And you find a lot of data on that, but, but actually learning is something that you have to observe. And I'm really inspired by the work of um, Professor Lundvall and of um, Professor Johnson. I really notice an emphasis there also over the publications over time, that learning does not only happen in these firms, I think everybody knows that, but that this learning happens between the production structures and the institutional arrangements. And then of course, the policy makers. Um, and it's much, it's easy to imagine how to stimulate learning in the form of a project. But it's much harder to think of learning as something that actually emerges out of people's past history of working together and people's ambitions for the future. And one of the challenges that I often have when I'm working in the field is who has the legitimacy to pull different people together, to create these opportunities for people to learn together? Who has the power to protect individuals from sharing, um, from failing, and from taking risks. Actually, in, in many of my projects, I have the challenge that none of the institutions want to acknowledge that, they, that there's some things that they don't know. So what I do playfully when I'm teaching or when I'm building capacity or supporting my clients is I say, everybody can start to help improving the innovation system from where they are. I tell my students and I tell my clients, don't go and analyze another system. Start from where you are. How can you, from where you are, enable learning in your environment or with those people that you are working with? And again, do not treat the system and its actors as a subject to be studied, like an insect in a jar, but to pull these people in as participants and to recognize them as agents in a complex adaptive system. So to get others to become more innovative, we as innovation systems practitioners, as representatives of institutions and of different organizations, we have to first become innovative and we have to become innovative about how we work with other people. So we have to strengthen not only people's competence, but also people's confidence to try new things. So I'm going to leave it at that, um, but my wish for the future of, of this field, and, and Momo asked last time that we imagine what the next book will be about. My wish is that we can act on what we know, not just in how we study systems, but how we engage in systems. I thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, sorry to uh, no, it's okay. disturb you with my... <laughs> Morning, but uh, I think you've been raising some uh, very, very interesting and fundamental issues, particularly looking right down at the, uh, the enterprise level and institutions, as you said, you start from there, perhaps uh, without assuming there are models or to apl apply and then to how uh, the learning takes place and from then work your way uh, through a variety of, of, of uh, types of uh, institutions. Of, of, innovation, including social uh, technology, social innovation, and organizational innovation. And I was very, very uh, uh, interested uh, when you made the link with the, um, the work of Marius Carey about the emerging of this learning uh, dimension, and uh, of course, the work of uh, Val and Johnson. Thank you very much. I'm sure we will have many questions you have been uh, uh, inspiring to uh, the, the audience. Thank you again. Right, uh, I think we'll go now to uh, uh, to Andrew's work, and uh, Andrew is uh, going to uh, talk about the uh, sp something very specific about technological change, and uh, particularly through uh, reading the one of the chapters of of the book, and. Uh, specifically by Jens Müller and his colleague, and see how this uh, approach of technical chance and who, what he called also grassroots uh, innovation in Tanzania can be uh, re uh, reframed today, in today's reality. Uh, Andrew is a, a development anthropologist carrying out research on diverse uh, problems related to a territorial development in the Salvadorian and Central American context, 
on the periphery of the global south. He uh, holds a PhD from the Department of uh, Development and Planning from the University of Aalborg with a research specialization in the emergence and evolution of innovation capabilities and territorial system of innovation uh, in Central America, Latin America. And I had the pleasure to work closely with Andrew on this concept of territorial system of innovation and modes of emergence. And we have an article and hopefully a special issue coming. Thanks, uh, Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Abdel Kader, and to all the colleagues here and the organizers of this uh, very interesting uh, dialogue. Um, I have a trying to make a special contribution, um, trying to uh, reveal the value of work to, that argues for changing the outlook and recognizing the capabilities of the indigenous or art, endogenous artisan task networks of actors to create another or alternative path to development in local systems of innovation. Um, I want to uh, recognize the work of my uh, uh, master's and PhD uh, supervisor, Jens Mueller, and his partner, Pernille Bertelsen, in their chapter in the book and their further work afterwards based on long time of, of uh, investigation on technology, technology change, and then introducing a focus on innovation in the work that they've been doing. Um, had the really privilege to work with, with Jens. He can't be here for uh, personally for his own health problems, but uh, I wanted to uh, try to put his work in dialogue with the arguments that Chris Freeman puts out in the introduction, and also some of the people who've been talking and, and uh, reflecting um, uh, in this series. So, um, go ahead. Okay, there it goes. Uh, so, one, you know, we have several uh, introductory talks. Uh, Luke said, recognize the emergence importance of grassroots innovations under the radar, which obviously the Xian Fu has talked about and, and, and put on the, the, put in the agenda. Uh, also, the mobilization of local or indigenous knowledge to take on the global challenges of inclusive, inclusive sustainable development in our new reality. That I'm going to connect to what, but there's a recognition of that, um, a recognition by um, a recognition that uh, we need to see in the dynamic evolution of global and national context, especially segmentation of markets, new opportunities, um, see in Africa's enormous diversity of localized knowledges embedded in production systems in different national and subnational regional local contexts, a key potential to take advantage of these opportunities to build alternative, innovative, inclusive, sustainable development paths. And this requires an integrated, multiple level, a multi-actor uh, strategies, many, lots of facilitation, as Sean argues, of, of learning processes between actors with different, very different world outlooks. And Freeman argues in, in, in the beginning that uh, this is obviously a challenge to trace these multiple interacting cultural and institutional subsystems is indeed a, a challenge to understand what actually exists in innovation systems, not just bring ideas about how they should be, but actually look what exists and build up from those innovation networks and see their potentials. I add also their limitations, he says, to devise ways to deliver greater benefits to all peoples in Africa as a fundamental need for the continent. I argue that uh, the contribution of Mueller and Bertelsen takes up this challenge in looking to explicate what social learning processes are reproducing and transforming indigenous endogenous systems of innovation, their potential as a contribution, but all of need to recognize their very um, differences. So they argue um, that uh, local or endogenous generation of technological innovations exists 
but are often ignored. Um, a fundamental problem is that uh, you have micro innovative strengths uh, emerging in niches that, that, that exist, but often may remain isolated and encapsulated. Again, the need for making the connections and facilitating the connections that I, I think Sean has uh, talked about. Facilitating connections between the rural and the urban, for example, context would be really important. They reveal the most important constituent uh, parts or, uh, and dynamics of these informal segments or endogenous segments of national production technology systems they focus on Tanzania. Um, they offer us an interesting and I think complementary systematic systemic conceptualization of technology. It's my personal view that uh, systems of innovation needs to open up and have a broader idea of technology and technology of uh, dynamics, especially the dialectical relation between these dynamics and uh, societal context. Um, they highlight the innovation capability of informal technology change agents. They look at village blacksmiths and, and boat builders and people working in ceramics to demonstrate that local knowledge systems and organizational forms are dynamic and can just constitute a unique production system that indicate um, the formation of another or alternative different evolutionary path that is rather uh, it has a different trajectory than the technological evolution experienced in the North. And it's all frequently proposed as part of this modernization development theory. We need to be very critical. If we're not uh, uh, part of that, calling these people uh, backwards, lazy and crazy, um, instead of recognizing who they really are and their potentials. Um, they argue that uh, on a national sector, or regional level, Production systems are segmented along institutional lines, um, formal, informal, but also technological dimensions between the exogenous outside and the endogenous. And the rules of the game in these endogenous systems of innovation are very different. And we really need to see them. We can have a framework, we can have a, uh, a way of looking at innovation system but recognize that they are fundamentally different and they work in different ways. And as we go region to region, country to country, they're also going to be rather different. So Freeman recognizes the importance of the heritage of existing knowledge as exists in endogenous, territorially embedded networks of actors, driving innovation in artists and manufacturing as in Tanzania that this can only be harnessed in numerous local grassroots projects and institutions, local dynamics like uh, uh, Sean was, was talking about, but that these need a, a continent-wide interchange of ideas. Um, I think that's really important and we could add on between continents and talk about Latin America and Asia and, and Africa in, in dialogue. But that we need to really recognize that as part of uh, not just to, to be studied, but also be subject to, as part of the discussion, um, the need for dialogue to be established between agents in all these different segments of the national um, and continental systems of innovation with the purpose to facilitate and enhance mobilization of the technological knowledge and organizational capabilities of indigenous endogenous artisans. These are real, and it's very difficult to engage in learning because we're in different places, very radically different places. Um, I mean, knowledge, knowledge which recognize and value positively the actual existence and change readiness of indigenous technologists, not to fantasize or, or, or over emphasize what what's positive now, but they're ready to change and they have been changing and they've been innovating in their innovative networks. And we need to recognize that in the dialogue with advanced technology and advanced science, how can we make that dialogue happen? We need to be much more focused on that kind of learning. Um, finishing here, yes. here just for doing away with ahead. prevailing Afro-pessimism. Pessimism. This creates a sense of defeat fatally hindering any possibility of clarity as an expression of lack of creative imagination and argues, demonstrate the capabilities of human talent in 
rural informal sector, I'd say we could see the same in urban areas in, in its widest sense, uh, are really ready to be mobilized, or right? are really interested in, in making changes, or actively researching what happens in markets, what's happening with their clients, and providing over time, you know, innovative products and both in, in the metal mechanics. And they've faced many odds. They faced a colonial system with which to, 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 to devastate them. They faced then uh, afterwards many problems. They faced the neoliberal uh, policies of, you know, eliminating state support, but they're still there and they're still innovating and we should recognize their importance. And so here, uh, they ask questions which I would now ask to the, to the audience as part of a discussion, how to expand the area of synergistic and complementary interaction, i.e. connecting the formal and informal elements, the endogenous and exogenous elements to make means eat, meet in our innovation systems. And I would say in a different way, how can uh, science, technology and innovation driven development actually create gardening policies that uh, recognize and support the emergence and strengthening of territorial collective innovation capabilities, building on what's there and systems of innovation with interactive learning spaces. I'm borrowing from Judy Seuss and Arasena's concepts uh, here for inclusive and sustainable human development. Uh, leave that to questions for the discussion. Uh, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. Um, I really wanted to uh, have an opportunity to honor um, Jens Mueller and his colleagues and their contribution. Hopefully I've done so. I've added some uh, their literature here at the end. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Andrew. Thanks for uh, taking your time and uh, of course, uh, giving us a fresh look at what uh, Jens Mueller wrote about 18 years ago, and particularly in reminding us also there are some dimensions which probably uh, are forgotten and in particularly this co-evolution between uh, formality and informality or informal technical what you call informal technology change agents this is very important to bring us uh, to uh, examine more uh, carefully and of course to update our knowledge about what uh, is happening at uh, the local indigenous system and of course, so this need for dialogue, which is a very uh, important issue, because unless all the uh, key players and uh, stakeholders are involved in this endogeneity, uh, 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 then probably uh, that will not uh, uh, do it. And it's also interesting to uh, to, to to bring uh, give a, a new, uh, I would say, optimism to uh, to African countries that they could. Uh, starting from all the uh, knowledge uh, they have accumulated and uh, probably create uh, new ways or to address development issues through innovation and building capabilities. And of course, the two key questions you raised, which are, uh, of course, uh, are fundamental because I think they still need uh, a lot of work to be done, to be answered, but we leave them to the audience. Thanks uh, again. Uh, and uh, we go to the list, uh, but not the last but not least uh, uh, speaker, who is uh, Iran. Are you here? Yes. Um... Yes. Uh, so, oops. I've lost my, let's see. So uh, Diran is addressing a very important uh, issue and I deliberately asked him to come at the end because I think he really gives us a perspective to bring all these ends together and possibly link uh, various things which we'd love to, to link up. That is uh, on one hand, the uh, work of uh, uh, Chris Freeman, uh, uh, whom he calls it the, a bridge between different worlds. I like that uh, notion of a bridge between different worlds. And of course, the uh, putting Africa first uh, and how it, we could develop uh, and the, the work along this, uh, this line. 
So, uh, Giran uh, Somali is a senior lecturer uh, in innovation policy and management, and is also a director of the Master of Management in Innovation Studies program at the WITS Business School, University of the WITS Waters and South Africa. He is a graduate from, uh, got his PhD from a public policy from Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta in Georgia. Uh, Diran, uh, the floor is yours Go for another 12 minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. I'll just try and load my presentation Go ahead. Okay. Can you see my first slide? Not yet. Uh, yes, that's fine. Okay. Because should I should I maximize? Yeah. This All right. Nice. So this is just the panel that we're on. Uh, so the title of of my contribution today is that innovation systems as a theoretical rendezvous or meeting place. Uh, implications for sustainability transitions in Africa. So I'll start with a motivational quote by the late Professor Wangari Matai, who in her Nobel Peace Prize lecture uh, so told us that uh, today we're faced with a challenge that calls for a shift in our thinking so that humanity stops threatening its life support system. We're called to assist the earth to heal her wounds and in the process heal our own. Indeed, to embrace the whole of creation in all its diversity, beauty, and wonder. So the notion of sustainability transitions need not be seen narrowly as uh, technological transitions, but as a transition uh, in, in, in the healing of the human spirit itself in conjunction with, um, with the natural world. Uh, Professor Chris Freeman, uh, in, with respect to sustainability in a very nice paper published in 1996 in Technological Forecasting and Social Change, uh, predicted that ICT offers many possibilities of energy and material savings. They offer even more radical possibilities through telecommuting, enabling people to work at home and avoid the journey to work at least for some days in the week. They might also reduce the need for air travel through teleconferencing teleconferencing techniques. It must be said, however, that these possibilities have been slow to materialize. This was exactly 25 years ago. I think uh, you will all agree with me that we're living Chris Freeman's prediction today. Lastly, we'll go to Professor Kwesi Kwapra in a, in a, in a book chapter titled, uh, Culture, the Missing Link in Development Planning in Africa, it says that the adaption of science and technology to suit the cultural and institutional foundations of the social life of a given people affirms the sense of confidence and cultural well being of the people concerned. So we can think of sustainability transitions as ecological in scope, as cultural in scope, as technological in scope. Uh, and all of these are trans jointly transformative. And we have leading thinkers are guiding us in this direction. So I refer to Chris Freeman uh, as, as a bridge between worlds because uh, while we've all been edified by the uh, leading innovation system scholars, innovation scholars in general, um, many of whom have been, have participated in this series, I think Chris Freeman has been, uh, for me at least, the one of, of, of his generation of scholars to have resonated with me, even if he didn't explicitly write about Africa very much. Uh, for instance, in his conceptualization of the nation in the national innovation system, uh, we all know he's, he's one of the, the, the co-founders co of this uh, framework. Uh, he said, however, you know, the nation is not static in time. If you go back to, uh, and this is in, in a European context, so, well, the city-states and the city-states became 
uh, principalities. Principalities became kingdoms. Kingdoms turned into states and nation states, and they fell apart and they reconglomerated. So, so there's actually an evolution of, of, of this concept in nation of the nation over time. And we cannot assume that the current dominant uh, state formation is the only one that has ever been, or is that the only one will ever be. And this is a paper he published in 2002 in research policy called uh, Continental, National, and Subnational Innovation Systems, Complementarity and Economic Growth. And I think it's a value, very valuable way of thinking about the, the, the nation in the national innovation system as not a state innovation system exclusively, but as broader than that. But what is the key? What is the glue? He insisted that it was the social capability for technical and institutional change. That was the key. And this can exist, I think we can agree, in subnational, national, supranational uh, arrangements. And that's what we should be looking for as the glue to a system. Um, secondly, he historicized innovation systems uh, in, in ways that uh, not all that many scholars have done. And in his classic paper in the Cambridge Journal of Economics, the National System of Innovation Historical Perspective, he goes once again through how this theory emerged. He said, well, look, uh, even though the innovation systems concept came out of a particular group of scholars, uh, the notion that technological change and institutional change uh, co-evolved to drive human development, to, to drive growth, goes way back in history. And he highlighted uh, many examples of that. Uh, he's also very generous in his acknowledgement of the neoclassical tradition, the so-called new growth economics by people like um, uh, Edelman and Helpman and Paul Romer, uh, coming to acknowledge the centrality of, of uh, technological change in long-term economic growth of course, associated with um, with with non-technological changes, and this also gives us the confidence that uh, we can think of African innovation systems in a historical perspective, and not just in the perspective of the the static uh, states that we have inherited from the colonial partition. Uh, thirdly, uh, he speaks to the lo locating innovation in the sustainability discourse. So this paper on greening technology and models of innovation speaks to the importance of technological change in, sus in, this, uh, in, in sustainability transitions. I'll move faster. So what, what does that mean for us? So then we can ask the question, well, uh, oh, sorry. Well, where, where is the nation then in African innovation system? Um, and I think here, putting Africa first was a very critical effort in that. But I'll go to a recent book by um, a brilliant it's young Ethiopian uh, scholar, Adam Gethachu, who wrote a book on world making after empire, showing that the newly independent states in Africa and the Caribbean in particular, uh, were not just seeking to establish their political independence, but wanted to change the, the political uh, and economic world order into a more egalitarian one. Uh, and then she goes on to suggest that their visions were beyond the narrow, but were seen as a contribution to a more equitable uh, global exchange. However, most of those failed or, or were not as successful as expected. And that has led to the, the, the kinds of um, fragile, or, 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 or states that, that we have across the African world. Um, secondly, uh, Amy Nyang is a Senegalese scholar who was formerly a colleague at WITS in the Department of Politics, um, but she, she's a brilliant scholar. And she reflects on the post-colonial African state in transition, thinking of older models of statehood and sovereignty in interaction with the Westphalian state that uh, dominates the, the, the world order and says, what can we draw from old modes of state and nation formation that can inform modern day uh, policy making? And that's also a very fruitful uh, engagement. And now the uh, UNESCO that published the, an influential eight volume series on the general history of Africa going from 
uh, studying a prehistory is now talking about the concept of global Africa for its forthcoming ninth volume that says, well, Africa is, of course, the territory, the continent called Africa, but that territory is the site of exchanges of people coming from Europe, from Western Asia, from uh, South Asia, uh, coming, uh, and of course, Africans deported from their continent at various times to move to the Caribbean, to the Americas, to Asia, and that there's a flux and reflux of movement that constitutes the African uh, experience. Uh, it's inclusive and it has different uh, anchors, but it's a site of mixing, it's a site of interaction, and it can be seen that way. And so we need not think of Africa as just the African continent or the indigenous people of the African continent, but all of those who have contributed to shaping it, but who have a commitment to a certain value of, of, of the human being. And this is coming forth, uh, forthcoming by UNESCO. And this notion of global Africa, I think there's no better reflection of it than putting Africa first, contributions from China, from India, from South America, from Europe, all committed to elevating uh, the, the humanity, but starting with African humanity, which is obviously connected to all of humanity. And this more expansive notion, I think is useful to consider. Okay, so moving forward to the innovation concepts, this notion of industrial revolution, uh, Africans have always participated in it. The first industrial revolution is Africans, were central to that, even though it's not acknowledged in the literature. In 2002, Joseph Nicori, building on the work of scholars like Walter Rodney and Eric Williams, highlighted this, the significant contribution of Africans in the first industrial revolution. The second and the third would characterize- One minute by, left, Diran, just to remind <laughs> you that time increasing is Increasing inequality. And so when now we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, we need to ask the question, how is that going to help resolve inequality? And the work by uh, Zama Mazbuko and Erika speak to that. Uh, but so speaking of endogenous innovation, then how do we bring modern technologies to bear in contexts that are characterized by poverty and uh, technological modesty? This is a nanowater filter based in Tanzania, an understanding of the water sources and filtering is there. In Benin, the Songhai Green Belt Movement is a, another rural city movement is another way to ground modern technologies in a rural setting. This is a cook stove experience in Ghana, again, using designs to create energy efficient uh, stoves um, and, and solar panels in the same environment. So the point, then I'll stop here. The point is that, yes, we know that innovation is more than just technology. It's also about institutional uh, innovation, but it's about embedding technological innovation in, in uh, various societal forms. So the state is only one of them. The private sector is one of them. Social enterprises, community organizations are others. And it, what we're interested in is the social capability for change and not necessarily the name of the institution. The, the, what, but what Chris Miriam brings to us most importantly is that this is informed by a historical perspective, an understanding of how, what people's relations are like, who's likely to do what, who prefers to work with each other, and so on. So uh, lastly, creative destruction comes from, uh, was inspired by um, Shiva, the Hindu deity, and Rabindranath Tagore uh, expressed that. So even Champeta's creative destruction didn't come from uh, Austria. And this is the final uh, this is from a manager of an energy, green energy firm. She says, I have to concede that we have not found a way to build a solar farm that tilts in a unique way to the African sun. The reemergence of great African civilizations is the ultimate goal of our journey away from oppression and towards freedom. So uh, innovation systems for freedom, for justice is something that we need to consider. Thank you very much. I am done. Thank you very much, uh, Diran. Innovation systems with the freedom. <laughs> That's a very <laughs> important way and a very exciting way to, to, uh, to complete this uh, round table discussion with the panels. And uh, it's very, very important what you've been uh, 
putting forward. I think linking up all the historical uh, facts, perspectives, and the, uh, of course, the uh, all the reality of the uh, field and the ground and how various experiences remind us that Africa has great potential and thinking in terms, and in, in a way you have linked so, to some extent your work to what Alan was saying at the, the beginning that the, uh, there's some in, in, in the long term, you historicize and you conceptualize uh, at the same time because they're all both uh, linked and through uh, the work of, uh, of, of Christopher Freeman. Uh, I think I'll leave it to that for the comments. And uh, I don't know, Rajesh, how we are in time. We don't probably have much time left, but can we ask, uh, raise a few questions or ask people to raise sure. questions? Sure, sure, there is no problem. We can extend the session by another 15 minutes. OK, uh, yeah. thanks, uh, Rajesh. We have uh, 15 minutes, so please. Uh, I the floor is open because I think uh, 15 minutes for the wealth of uh, uh, presentations we have had is, is is not enough. We would could spend another couple of hours discussing what all this material, which is very very uh, rich and challenging as well, and probably sets the uh, the way for for the post putting Africa first. And probably uh, Rajesh might say a word uh, on that issue. Rajesh, if you could. Uh, uh, take the floor and tell us a bit more built on what you've had, particularly what, what, what Diran was saying. Are you asking me to speak? Yeah, ask? yes, go ahead, yes. You want us to ask? The proposal you, you were putting forward, how we could go on from all these elements, give a few introductory ele elements to rewriting, uh, uh, putting Africa first. Uh, you seem to have few yeah. hint to some elements. Can you, uh, you and the Mamo, of course, will, will come into it. Because this is, I think, no, it's I time. Think this, we, we, this yeah. Idea, yeah, this idea emerged uh, as a result of re uh, reading uh, the a few pages uh, from the book. Uh, I think the book is not in print now it is out of print and it is not available now so the preface the wonderful preface written by freeman to this book very small piece but i think it was very far sighted and and uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, at a time written at a time when both the inner thinking of innovation in africa as well as the concept of national systems of innovation were quite young uh, so in 2003, they were new, quite new. But uh, South Africa had adopted national systems of innovation as, the, as a policy tool uh, in 1996 itself, uh, the, the, on, uh, in the first white paper. But uh, in the latest white paper, which, was, uh, which came out in 2018, we see that uh, South Africa probably was a uh, has not fulfilled uh, the, the, the objectives uh, set in the first white paper. Okay. So uh, the adoption of uh, national systems of innovation has not translated well into policy outcomes in reality. So this uh, made uh, us to think what would be the reasons? Uh, did the neoclassical orthodoxy silence the effort? Or, or what went wrong? Uh, was uh, South Africa not prepared uh, to, to, to take on the, the emerging concept? So I think, uh, I thought this, uh, this series will deliberate such issues and what uh, prevented the full-fledged uh, result-oriented adoption of the framework. So now it is a time to rethink and I hope uh, the series, we have three more episodes to, to go. Uh, by the end, uh, we will take a, take a decision uh, whether, to, whether to work on a revised version of the book. Will Professor Mamo take that challenge to, uh, to produce a revised version with his colleagues? Or a, a new book uh, will emerge uh, given uh, the, the changed scenario. So this is my take. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Roger. Thanks for this uh, 
suggestions and proposals. And of course, we are just introducing the debate. We still have three uh, sessions to work. go in depth into what what prospects and uh, some people who think who read the book and said the book is so uh, actual and we don't even need need to rewrite it because so many issues are still valid up to now. If you read it, you think you have written it yesterday, not uh, 18 years ago. So you see, uh, just to tell you how deep and how important the issues which, uh, uh, of course, we have uh, we've been covering when we wrote that book collectively. Uh, Mamo, would you add uh, a few elements before just we... Just a few points. We yes. Have... Thank, thank you very much. But I'm sorry uh, I had a network issue. So uh, at least... Uh, Andrews well, and uh, Sean, I was not able to listen to you, but I'm pretty sure you have also made very good contributions. But the, the interesting thing I saw in this se session now, the panel, is excellent ideas, really, genuinely. Very provocative ideas have come. So our Geshe has, co has connected urban and rural, and, and, and how do we do it with innovation system is a very interesting challenge. Uh, now our brother uh, Baskaran has brought lessons what others have achieved, like China and uh, all the other countries that have done, and what Africa can learn, but not copy, but at least understand what has been done so that they can also uh, do. The other key thing that came out with uh, also with the uh, 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 my Diran is that he uh, brought the first, the second, the third industrial revolution. Africa did lose these three revolutions. Now we're in the fourth industrial revolution or the fifth and fourth. The interesting question now is with this digital technology now, with the so extraordinary that Chris Freeman in 1996 actually predicted what we're in now. It's amazing. Is there any chance now? Because now we don't, we are not into agriculture. We're not into rural and urban. The technology is everywhere. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have digital agriculture, digital manufacture, digital services. So if we're doing that, is there any chance now in, in our disputing Africa first kind of thing? Is there a way we could actually bring in the current or the different technologies, blockchain, internet of things, 3D printing, all these things that's happening, artificial intelligence, all this. Is there a way we could actually think about how uh, all, all the world can be uh, changed in such a way that justice, as you, uh, as you rightly put it, uh, for all and well-being for all, and not just for uh, one part against another part, but for the whole uh, world can come. It's a very important time now. We have a, a global uh, climate change. We have also uh, coronavirus global. It is global. It is not affecting only one part. So now we need an approach, a technological approach, also an innovation approach that actually can solve problems together, bring all of us collaborative, to be collaborative and cooperative. How do we do? We uh, develop that. I think now let's think of how we can be together not just uh, when we write this, I'm putting Africa for, when on the Africa side, we should bring in Latin Americans, Asians, Europe, all of us should be together so that we actually reflect together and come out. The good thing about this putting Africa first is that it's not just Africans writing, it's how connected we are globally. And even the people who uh, contributed, all of them, it's just so fascinating. That, that's why it's very good we, sh we should continue like that. There's just my few suggestions. Uh, about about the points and all of you could reflect on uh, i'm not asking you like a question but i'm just reacting to your uh, positively about your uh, your very nice inspiring inputs uh sorry about andrew and sean i i my i don't know what happened to my i missed you but i wish i, I could have heard you because i would have i would have reacted you know to you also thank you so much thanks very much mama thank you very much going presenting these useful comments which are already very rich and very useful for the, uh, the way forward and I think I probably uh, will bring them back again to future uh, meetings of the panels. 
uh, time is practically well, time's up, but we have a question on the chat. Uh, per, a question from uh, Andrew. Andrew, perhaps you could formulate this question if, as you are here. And uh, if anybody could come in uh, to, uh, to perhaps raise the issue and, and complete uh, the question, that would be useful. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, we know that in, in African and Latin American context, the, the rural urban divide uh, is one uh, problematic um, uh, between a diversity of, of types of, of, of territories. Um, I don't see it's been really uh, discussed so much. So I had the question, how could we um, understand and take advantage of the dynamics uh, between rural, urban and, and, and rural areas uh, from this innovation perspective to, um, to take on the problems of, of, of the two areas? Is there something specific about uh, that dynamics that we could uh, take advantage of? Very good. I think it's a very, very relevant and uh, key issue how to connect between two types of dynamics and two types of vision of develop uh, of uh, innovation system, urban and rural. Uh, I wonder whether Jesse, who has given us some very, very interesting elements about the systemic approach to uh, urban uh, innovation and cities, and uh, whether she could perhaps bring in some elements from her own perspective. Jesse, are you around? Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm sorry here. to. Yeah, <laughs> I am mute. Uh, yes, you, you've had uh, certainly the Andrew's question. Can you can you perhaps react to that and how you, how you figure out because you had a systemic and broad uh, approach when you talked about urban. It wasn't only about urban, but it was way much wider. So can you tell us perhaps a bit more how you connect to to subsystems? I would say. Yeah, yeah. So actually, one of the big issues, which is more political than an academic issue in South Africa, has been, if you want, the resistance to any urban conversation, which is why you probably, and, and there's maybe also some practical reason for it. Um, and so one of the things we really have tried to do is to express the urban as not something different, even spatially from rural, but a, a continuum. Uh, and so part of what we suggest is that we perhaps make some effort to understand that rather than having this dichotomous idea that there's something called urban different from something called rural. I'm in Nairobi right now. Mama will be happy to know visiting my mother who, who loves Mama <laughs> dearly. <laughs> and um, I, I sometimes Hello, look her. around my mother <laughs> and I sometimes <laughs> wonder when I look at my mother's property, whether this really be belongs in anything any of you might think of as a city, because really what she's got here is a. <laughs> <laughs> a little a small farm Roland on a very <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> um and so i think maybe that's one of the answers but i think it's an interesting question in terms of the academic work as well because often our, the scholars are organized that way as well so many innovation scholars who are looking at spatial issues will look at rural systems uh, mm -hmm. and then a few of us increasingly are looking at urban systems so i think maybe there's an interesting question and challenge for us there uh, in terms of really beginning to see what we can learn from uh, a, a more sort of continuum approach than really dichotomizing these things. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, JCA. Okay. Very, very useful. Sorry, very useful comments. And I think that has brought some light to uh, 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 at least preliminary uh, answer to, uh, to uh, Andrew's, uh, Andrew's queries. And I, I'm sure that the, I'm sure that the question will require a lot more in-depth uh, uh, investigation, uh, Andrew, we can't just solve it by just uh, adding two systems, but it really it has to be. I think, uh, to, in my view, this was the only question, so perhaps uh, just we have uh, come to the end of our time and uh, we yeah. close it here because I think, uh, and I suggest that the dialogue goes on through chats and, and whatever. Is yeah. that, is that okay? Maybe I, think, I think it's okay. Comment. Comment? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Mamo, did you want to to close? No. Uh, word isn't for closing it possible that, isn't it possible they they you give them a little bit to just say one minute each each of them say something and then we close okay. it. If yeah. if yeah, sure, sure. So, why, Askram, but, please, please speak. Or if I anyone, let's see, let's put it as on a voluntary basis. If anyone wants to add. Uh, yes. Another element, after having listened to the other panelists, 
it, it might bring uh, other ideas to his own input. So please, uh, for oh. one minute, as Mamo said, one minute to just give us your, your, your feedback or your additional elements to what we have been uh, right, uh, yeah. presenting at I say already, Andrew is raising his hand. Uh, so Andrew, perhaps we can start with you, yes? Go ahead. I, I certainly like that Sean's uh, provocation from a more practical side of, of working with systems of, of innovation. I think many of us have some experience in that. How do we actually go from being researchers to facilitating processes with actors that are part of these systems of innovation to actually move into, into the practice? Uh, uh, there's the policy side, but there's also the day-to-day -day, um, trying to promote innovations in, in institutions and and, and firms. So I think we could have more discussion about that um, and what that says also is how uh, our analytical framework works or doesn't work when applied to practical uh, facilitation. Judith wants to say. Yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that um, we are reminded because that is one of the greatest challenges and, and, and based on the experience that we've had in taking it to the ground. And that is where you can actually have the impact that we want to have. So I think that those discussions and also in terms of actually studying what happens when you facilitate these processes will help. And, yeah. and I want to add one more, I, I, I really and truly, think that we, we need to look at agriculture in more depth. Sorry. Thank you. Thank, thanks, uh, Judith. Judith. Thank, Judith and thanks, uh, Andrew, for these uh, final comments. I think they're uh, complementary and they, uh, they draw our attention to the need to perhaps go further in uh, the next uh, uh, in, in future panels and, and also in the second round of, of innovation of, uh, of writing perhaps the book. Thank you very much. Sean has something to say. Let Sean speak, please. Okay. Please, please, Sean, please. So, something that I um, just want to share is I often move between urban spaces and rural spaces places with lots of institutions, places with few institutions, places with very clear policies and places with no policies. I think, and I'd like to think that the principles stay the same, but the priorities are always different. You know, so the principles of how to do innovation system promotion in a rural area will be the same, but the priorities will be very different. And the con because the context is so different, I think also that um, in many places where we work, agriculture is seen the whole time as behind. But if you think of climate change, then suddenly agriculture is right at the front. If we look at parts of Southern Africa and um, Western Africa where um, the climate is changing, where towns that were previously agricultural towns are now surrounded by semi-arid desert. And suddenly this agricultural community is at the future. They, they where the future eats um, mankind. And we have no institutions, no extension services, no special interventions there trying to work on new farming technologies dealing with, you know, these climate change. And then just on the other side of the country, we have more rain in a different time. So, um, you know, I think that two points then. The first is the principles stay the same, but our priorities is different. And the second time is we mustn't always just look at catching up. We must also see what is emerging in the near future. Um, you know, how are the context and the environment changing? And what does that require um, of an, a healthy innovation system? Because if we're now going to try and help the people in this area that's dry, we just farm better. We're completely missing the point of, of, of you know, what the future is busy telling us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Sean, for this. And this, is, and yeah. sorry, I'm, sorry, sorry, <laughs> and I'm the there, Yes, uh, yes, Judith, you wanted to. Yes, and talk? this reinforces the. It reinforces the importance of competence building. Yeah. 
yes. because when you build the the, the 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 competencies it means and, and it's, it was mentioned in my, my presentation about being able to recover anticipate and recover after uh, after shocks and those are some of the things that we also need to be studying so when we talk about competence building is uh, of course, as Sean mentioned, it's not it's about all the, the actors, but it's also about how you deal with change. And um, when I was chair of the, the, the Tropical Agricultural Platform, I, I, I should have shared that link too. They came, we, we developed the common framework. And part of this whole thing about strengthening innovation is how do you help the, the actors deal with complexities? So uh, I don't want to um, prolong the argument, but it's also something that we need to be studying and we need to, to also show the results of, of that, building the com competencies of the actors. Thank you. Yes, very, very well. I think it's Mr. Adal, may, 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 may uh, uh, one, uh, professor, professor Steve uh, is there. Can he make a remark? Okay. Who, okay. From uh, Manchester. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm okay. thinking forward to, to next week when I'm presenting, but I, what I like today, we went from the, the heights of uh, neo-colonialism, neo-imperialism, down literally to the, to, to the field and the factory floor. And I think that's that's a connection we have to constantly think about, the, the practical outcomes. So I'll, uh, I'm going to talk a, a bit about those different levels of connection perhaps next week. But, okay. And I think what, we, what we're getting through this, this sequence here is, um, it reminds me uh, of an old Gary Larson cartoon. The kid puts his hand up and says, uh, in, in the classroom, he says, please, sir, my, may I leave? My brain is full. I think there's so, such a richness of ideas here. I think we're going to need more than a week between each session to unpack them. And I hope going forward, I think, yes, I think maybe a, a second volume. I think the, you know, the, 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 the book still stands, stand up so well after 20 years. And uh, something even older, a book, I was involved with Chris Freeman talking about long wave cycles that uh, joined with the Royal College of Art in Sussex back in 1983. And again, you know, uh, the ideas are there and we get more and more evidence. But the challenge for us is where are we impacting on practice? Where are we helping people make a difference on literally on the ground uh, and in their societies? Uh, and that's that's, you know, the, the challenge we have to hold out to ourselves. So thanks everybody today. I think it's been, it's been terrific today. I'm still. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for, for, for your contribution. Well, Pascal, uh, uh, you had the final yeah. comment, perhaps. Just yeah. I think uh, we round up the, the session. When, Go ahead. when we talk about rural urban divide or the gap, and the developing countries and developed countries gap. Uh, Sean mentions briefly about catching up, the, the focus on catching up. If you look at the catching up uh, literature, they talk about more on firm side, the producer side. But what, what is happening now, if you see the urban users of technology, rural users of technology are catching up, or even sometimes if you look at the rural uh, users of technology in China, they are leapfrogging urban users of technology of developed countries. So we are missing something here. Uh, the, the, the user producer dynamics in catching up and leapfrogging. Now we are, we are we need to pay attention. Like Gacy said, she's sitting in her mother's farmhouse and talking to us. You know, we, we use, uh, Sean made a comment in that uh, uh, vision of uh, Freeman a uh, virus uh, made it possible now. But, you know, I, I, I was teaching online when I went to my village in India from two years ago or three years ago, I was teaching online my students in Malaysia. I was teaching, I was taking interviews from uni, UK universities sitting at my village home. So, so something is, uh, and, and today's villages in India, e-commerce has deeply penetrated. You know, my friend was telling those days only a couple of deliveries come by two wheelers. Now they come with trucks to deliver goods to, to villages, uh, uh, people buying online. So the, the users are leapfrogging. Uh, of course, we are more focused on the producer side catching up and leapfrogging. There is something interesting happening there. I, I think it is good to pay attention to that. Maybe. 
Thank you very much. I think that's a very important point. And uh, talking about defrocking and the, 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 the COVID situation has also given us the opportunity to see there has been uh, in an independent way in the South, some uh, very interesting phenomenon of catching of, of leapfrogging and and uh, uh, awakening some dormant capabilities. So I think the the positive side, if I may say so, of, of COVID has also developed a sense of self reliance into uh, going into some uh, technologies and making effort, uh, dynamic and independent effort without the help of uh, of anybody else. To, uh, to produce, to master, and to put all these uh, technologies to use for uh, to, to fight the pandemics, to find uh, all the ways and means to protect uh, oneself, etc. So that's also it's linking with with what you said. Okay, with this note, I will thank uh, everyone, all the panelists, and all the people who participated. And uh, I think, uh, as uh, I agree, that has been a very packed session with ideas and with way how to uh, go forward. I think we certainly have a lot to to write uh, uh, another volume, uh, Mamo, <laughs> just with the uh, session. So you see, you have a lot of prospects and a lot of work to do. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Thank uh, Mamo. Thanks, Abdel. Right. Thank, uh, thank you, Abdel. Thank you, No, no. You. Let me just let me thank you before all of you. I think I should I should close it. <laughs> you it need to be right. thanked. I think uh, we need to thank uh, you very much, uh, Abdel Gader, for uh, the excellent sharing. Very important, uh, and uh, you are very engaged from the beginning. I mean, you thought about it, and and where uh, Rajesh and I were very impressed by how you have done it so we need mm -hmm. to thank you and then we need to thank to be honest with you the the presentation uh, today this in this panel is exceptionally unique let me tell you why it, we're not just looking at the input side what should we do with technology to to transform or reform and develop it. also the output side what exactly the output even ideas like justice, well-being, many things came out. So what we are now thinking is if we are writing a new book, given the world we are in now with all these challenges, demographic challenges, climate challenges, uh, uh, you know, uh, health challenges, many of these challenges we have, economic, political challenges, all this. Because we have that, we are now thinking in terms of finding the output side and the input side. What does uh, input gener generate? Does it create problems, opportunities, benefits, or losses or gains? Something like that is, is going to come out, which means a unified approach, a holistic approach, an integrated approach is going to happen. And the reason why we're saying this is because the technology we are in now, as uh, Chris Freeman also 1996 observed it, and now we are now living in it, the entire technology is now universal is everywhere is anything and everything now technology is like that because of that we can't just divide ourselves by saying agriculture manufacture services these kind of things so now we are in a new world in a new approach so we our the only thing our biggest mistake is because we are we divide ourselves and instead of uniting ourselves we divide ourselves and we fight each other and we do many strange things we, uh, you know, like you see what America is doing now, military industrial complex and the military industry should should be should not is not necessary. Now we need a more uh, life saving industry, something like that in this technology. So my just suggestion to you is that this was an excellent and I congratulate you. I really, really genuinely uh, really loved this session very, very much. All of you are wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Thanks, Mamo, and we say goodbye to everyone. So, uh, thank, you, thank you, Abdul Gader. Thank you, thank you for, for for you know uh, chatting this long session, and uh, yes. you know it's it's not an easy job. Really, thank you for that. That's very Rajesh, kind of you. Please take a picture. Thank you very much. Yes. Taking a picture. But let's take a picture. Take a picture of all of us. <laughs> Taken. Thank you.
And Peter Decker. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> Iran. Very good. <laughs> Okay, yes, thank Sean you. is there. Bye bye. I'm happy. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. You've been all very fantastic. That's wonderful. Really wonderful thank session. You Excellent. Well, we'll it's look almost midnight here week. in Malaysia. So, <laughs> better go to bed. So you're doing, <laughs> uh, contributing. That's very nice. <laughs> That's very nice. Very, uh, very, nice. Yes. very engaged. Uh, Thanks, Sergis. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Very, very Thank nice. you. Bye-bye. Okay. See you soon. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank you. Professor Lisa is Thank here. I didn't know she was here. Just Thank you, Rajesh. Out. Very nice people. Yeah. Thank you very much. Lisa is there. Thank you. Bye. And very Professor good. Lisa Lisa is awake at 2 a.m. Just imagine. Yes. Oh. Yeah, Thank she's you. there. My God. My God. <laughs> Thank you. Australia, Bye -bye. Is, hey, hey, Australia hey. is always difficult here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Professor Lisa. Yes. Hey, Thank Professor you. Lisa. Your mic is pure, Professor Lisa. Your mic. What was that? Um, I, I don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for joining. Oh, Professor Lisa, the 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 guy from uh, Indonesia, he hasn't responded. So oh, okay, right on. Okay. Then I, I'm trying to get someone from Thailand, but he also said uh, he's gave me another uh, person. This is a suggestion yeah. from our brother from uh, uh, Angasvar Baskaran. He suggested uh, that, but but they are not. So I think maybe if there is no problem, is that okay? You can handle it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Declan, Declan was fine. So I'll just when you when you get those numbers back, I'll just uh, or the names back, I'll just finalise okay. the agenda. Thank you. And I've already warned Declan that we can we'll probably push the time out. So he said that's fine. He said we can go into half. We can go into penalty time. He said he's given me permission, okay. so we can go the other way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad. I just wanted to let you because I was I was able to. I didn't uh, I didn't get the time to send you the email, but I was. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. I haven't finalized. I'll just wait for it to come back, and I'll wait till we we hear back um, from the others, and then I'll just finalize the agenda. We've Thank still got three so weeks, much. so it's fine. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Sounds good. Anyway, thanks, Mamo. Thanks, Rajesh. Thank thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Yeah. Nice. Bye bye. Baskaran, send us your PowerPoint, please. We should. Uh, I want to upload it in uh, Sarchi. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'll do that. Send sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. I'll send it. Sure, sure. Thank you. Good night, Mama. Yeah, good night. <laughs> Lovely to see you. So happy. Bye. So happy to see you. I, we must meet physically and eat in Jera. Yeah, I hope I so. <laughs> I don't know when it's going to be. You know, we are, we are stuck I, now. I think I need, I need to go to London also and meet my Stephen Little. So I can yeah. I, I we have eaten some injera together. I take him yeah. to London. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Ethiopian <laughs> restaurants. <laughs> or I need to take him to Kerala also. That's my other home. Rajesh is yeah. uh, <laughs> looks after yeah, me. Sure. Once All things get right. back to normal, we'll do. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so lovely. Sean, very nice. Uh, all of them. They're very, very nice. Andrew is yeah. also very, very nice. Very nice. They're all nice. Thank you so much. Okay. It was excellent, yeah. Okay. It was excellent. Okay, Rajesh. Okay, good. Say goodbye now. Rajesh, you can, uh, yeah, send send us, uh, my Rajesh, we talk later. Huh? Okay, we Rajesh. Can, we can chat yeah. a bit, maybe. Bye-bye, yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I think you I should, you my, my bus, sure. you should sleep because it's too too late, too late there. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, it's okay. And, Tomorrow and is public it's, holiday here. It's oh, a okay. so independence all right. so day you can, here. Okay, please pass okay. our uh, loving regards to uh, Ananti. Please, please. All right, sure, sure. Okay. So definitely. Thanks a lot. Okay, okay thank God you. Bless. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank yes. you. Bye-bye. My Rajesh, we chat a little? Oh, sure, sure, sure. It's always a okay. pleasure chat. talking to you. Huh? <laughs> 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 My... <laughs> Rajesh, my teacher. <laughs> no, was, I, I liked, although the, there weren't many people, but it was yeah. excellent. The presentations were excellent. It was, excellent. Excellent. It was very good. amazing. Huh? Yeah. It was really amazing. Good. Yeah. No, actually, we, was, we don't need many people. We don't need no, 100 right. people. No. No, no, you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're right. And Bentuke, no, no, we, Bentuke was there. Bentuke was there. Yeah, he was there. He, he came yeah. and then uh, uh, Alan was there. I mean, they were okay. They were quite. About it was excellent. There. I and like then, Alan's then, presentation. It was fantastic. Alan, Alan did a good job. Alan. Oh, he did a very good job. Yeah, yeah, he did a very good presentation. 
Yeah. I I wrote something on on the, the chat yeah. telling him that it was very good. I think they were, I think all of them were very good. The only thing is I didn't see Sean's and Andrews. What was it? Yeah, we, uh, have. Uh, did, yeah huh? we have recorded everything. Oh, you've recorded it. Okay, yes, so I'll listen yes. to it. Okay. I'll put Fantastic. it on the, on the website.